पूनम क्या हाल है हेलो सर गुड इवनिंग सर क्या हाल चाल सर बस वेरी गुड वेरी नाइस क्या हाल है आपके गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर चांद गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग मैम गुड इवनिंग वेलकम डॉक्टर प्रकाश जॉन इन फ्रॉम विच नंबर विच नेम प्रकाश शास्त्री प्रकाश शास्त्री प्रकाश शास्त्री ओके वी कम ट्राइंग टू ओके फाइन यू गॉट इट सर Are we going to go uh, live at uh, six o'clock? So I have told him to go live so that it gets live. It should be getting live any moment now. But we will start okay. at six. We are going to start at six. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm just trying to get all the. Doctor Chakravarti will join a little late, okay, but sir. he will join certainly before six fifty. That's what he told me. Okay, sir. Adi Kaise chala gaya ji Dobara join kar rahi hai Has Dr Maclata joined So she joined I'm just trying to pin her Should I try to screen uh, share the screen Sure sir But it's saying that host has disabled. One second, sir. No, sir. Oh, one participant. Yeah, right. telling me host. All part. Okay, sir. Done, done, done. So check, sir. Okay. Yeah. Now I can try and do that. Yeah, what? It will have a bit. Pet name is different. Sugar powder. Sugar powder. Sugar powder. मैदे तो मैदे की तो करके लाएगी नहीं शुगर पाउडर ही Is it there now? Are you? Can, no. Can you not 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 the sharing screen. Mm hmm. Let me try again. I will cancel this. Try and share. Ah, uh, good evening, Bolia. Ah, uh ha. Ah, understand. Oh, oh, only one has to do that. हाँ हाँ ठीक है ठीक है ठीक है ओके हम्म 
Yeah. Now, can you see? Yes. Yeah, are you able to see now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Hi, good evening, Dr. Budhiraja here. Hi, Dr. Budhiraja. Kaise sir? How are you? Hi, good evening. Fine. Should I stop sharing okay, now? We are, yes, sir. We are live now also on YouTube. Good afternoon, sir. Has Dr. Daga joined? Yes, sir. I'm just trying to get them all on the same screen. In any case, we have the Raja here, so. हम दो मिनट आते हैं. ठीक है. अब हम से नहीं रुका जा रहा है. नीचे जा रहे हैं. हाँ. आप एक-एक करके जाते हैं तो बहुत आसान है. Requesting all participants to keep mute, please. I'm so dull, I'm not sick. I'm not
हेलो 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 वेलकम डॉक्टर बागा गुड इवनिंग नॉन स्टॉप एम फोर पी जैसे गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर चल क्या चल आपका बस ठीक है <laughs> लोगों की नन्नी सी जान हजारों काम आपके नन्नी सी जान करोड़ों काम अरे थैंकलेस थैंकलेस डॉग संदीप सर गुड इवनिंग क्या है दोस्त बस सर हाउ यू गुड वेरी फाइन वेरी फाइन कल बीत गया आज बीत रहा है होपफुली कल भी बीत जाएगा लिफ्ट फॉर द डे संदीप दुबले हो गए हो तुम सर मैं बहुत दुबला हो गया हूँ मेरा अभी दो हफ्ते कोविड से मैं था आई लॉस्ट टू थ्री के जीज वेट ओ माय गॉड मुझको भी कोविड हो गया ओके बट ठीक है दैट आई थिंक वाज गुड फॉर मी आई नीडेड टू शेड अ फ्यू के जीज संदीप क्या होता है तुम्हारा दो तीन किलो तो फर्क पड़ जाता है हमारे यहाँ तो साला दस बीस किलो भी कम है तब भी फर्क नहीं पड़ता हाँ जी आपने लॉग इन नहीं किया हिंदी का है ना पता है आदम दोस्त वे चिड़िया जो पर्यावरणी सब औपचारिक पत्र लिखन तो डॉक्टर अरुण लाल के कब आ रहे रेश मुझे वो क्रीम दे दे बेटा कैन यू ऑल प्लीज म्यूट योर सेल्फ Um, good evening, everybody. Um, it is six o'clock, so I think we can start shop now. If we can go on joining. So, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Um, as you all know, we are bang in the middle of the second wave of the pandemic, and uh, this wave has uh, thrown us all into a different kind of a framework. With the scenario being absolutely different last year to this year, uh, there have been no more number of cases, more infections, more super added infections. which has led to a lot of uh, requirement of actual information not discounting the discounting the whatsapp university 
So we need to have the actual information, what are secondary infections, what happens, what are diagnostic modalities, what are the infection control modalities, what are the warning signs and so on and so forth. So to answer some of the questions, the IMM Delhi chapter took on this initiative of holding a webinar and uh, so that we can have the experts from different fields uh, from medicine, critical care, ENT, ophthalm, mycologist, microbiologist to uh, answer some of the questions which are required. So I now hand over the mic to Devjan. Uh, to no, I first invite Dr. Achal Gurati, uh, Dr. Chan Vatal to speak a few words to start the proceedings. Sorry, Dr. Achal. Thank Dr. Vatal. Thank you, uh, Poonam. And uh, I welcome uh, all our members from uh, all across India and our special panelists. So I give me a second. I will be sharing my uh, my my slide. Am I visible? Not Hello. Yet. Not yet. Not yet, sir. Not yet, sir. Visible, sir. Okay. So welcome ladies and gentlemen uh, for our this live webinar. And uh, this is the heading that we try to choose for this time that the rise of the Titans after COVID. And uh, what we are actually faced with are the opportunistic infections. That's what we have been seeing now. And we thought this is the most opportune time that while people are talking about black fungus, black fungus, which I think my other panelists and speakers will put the record straight. And we should be actually talking about not only the fungi, we need to talk in totality as to what else can happen while we are trying to anticipate a third wave as well. So ladies and gentlemen, unprecedented crisis, which has impacted every uh, facet of life. And you name it and all are actually affected with this uh, uh, pandemic. So opportunistic infections in COVID you all will agree a diabetic COVID patient is going from the frying pan into the fire. And I'm very glad to present to you the faculty of excellence that we have amongst us who will be discussing threadbare the various opportunistic infections uh, that we have in, uh, in COVID. And it is not only fungal, we may have bacterial that has started showing up. We have fungal anyway and the viral, other viral infections also. So I was intrigued by a few uh, stray thoughts in the morning, and I also had a discussion on WhatsApp with our ex-president, Dr. Kulkarni. We both agreed that what has happened now? Why are we into a epidemic of mycormycosis? Diabetes is very common, we all know. Uncontrolled diabetes also is not so uncommon. Ventilators are day-to-day -day fear. Dr. Shastri will bear me out. We are not steroid freaks. All this is there for a long time. First phase of pandemic did not throw this fungus in this number. So is there more than what meets the eye? Therefore, a great opportunity for us as clinical microbiologists and epidemiologists and all other clinical colleagues who should be providing answers to all of us. So ladies and gentlemen, let us discuss this rise of titans after COVID opportunistic infections. And we have the excellent cream faculty with us who should be taking us uh, through this. Over to you. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Dr. Devjani, your online moderator for the session. Now, amidst one of the biggest global health crises that human race faces today, we cannot undermine the threat 
posed by the deluge of false information and myths that are doing the rounds in these digital times there is a lot of information out there as albert einstein rightly said information is not knowledge the only source of knowledge is experience we are fortunate to have with us today an esteemed lineup of extremely experienced speakers who would share their perspective and help us separate the facts from fiction on opportunistic infections post covid and also address the elephant in the room that is mucormycosis for the audience we would love to hear from you please post your queries if any in the chat box they shall be addressed at the end of each talk now without much ado i would like to introduce our first speaker for the evening dr sandeep budhiraja whose whose uh, reputation precedes him he is the group medical director max healthcare and senior director institute of internal medicine uh, he is responsible for overseeing the medical quality clinical governance clinician hiring and credentialing research and training and clinical data analytics across all 14 hospitals of max healthcare which presently operate more than 2000 beds in north india he joined max healthcare as a consultant physician in january 2001 and is a founder member of um, uh, over and he has a 23 year experience in field of internal medicine dr buddhi raja uh, is uh, known for his role as a group medical director and provides key clinical leadership in achieving clinical excellence patient safety and aims to create max healthcare as the most preferred hospital for clinicians to work in amongst his various achievements are he received the chairman's award for max healthcare in 2002 his he has his work in role of hiv infection in sporadic non a non b hepatitis cases in 1994 and he has an award for a prospective study for the role of various risk factors and h pylori on the causation of chronic duodenal ulcer sir kindly shed some light on opportunistic infection in covid era over to you sir thank you devjani and thank you unam and dr watal for giving me this opportunity to speak today uh, just give me a minute i share my screen so i hope the screen uh, the slides are visible to everyone yes okay so uh, i've been asked to uh, give an overview on opportunistic infections in uh, covid 19 era and i know the uh, hot topic of uh, today is uh, mucor but since there is a, a separate talk on that so i will be not talking much uh, on mucor mycosis and at the same time i would also sort of uh, dr daga's talk i don't want to overlap on that so the diagnostics part i'll uh, mainly leave it to him uh, to cover that uh this is just you know uh, to start off uh, this is some data uh, which we have been collating at max healthcare and if you see this graph on the left uh, you would be able to very beautifully identify the three waves uh, four waves are that we call this wave 2 for the country but actually for delhi ncr it is fourth wave and you can clearly see the difference of uh, the so called the second wave or the fourth wave for delhi as compared to the earlier waves it is absolutely steep uh, steep uh, and something which completely knocked all of us out and the last the lower most graph on the right side is basically again a reflection of the mortality numbers which have again shot up uh, in the last 4 to 6 weeks so uh, you know it's clearly a healthcare crisis for all of us now uh, we need to so when we talk about opportunistic infections because my talk would have lot of words like using co infection secondary infections or super infections just wanted to put in context as to what we are going to refer to so co infection would be an infection which occurs concurrently with the initial infection that's covid 19 and super infection or secondary infection would be an infection following a previous infection especially when caused by microorganisms that are resistant or have become resistant to antibiotics which have been used earlier and the difference between the two may entirely be just temporal uh and um, you know again to set the context that when we are talking of all these uh, opportunistic infections or super infections essentially what we are talking about is bacterial viral and fungal in infections and in this particular study 
um, they could identify co-infection in almost 12% of COVID-19 uh, patients who were hospitalized and super infections or secondary infections in 14%. And these were the ones who were clearly associated with poorer outcomes. Now, what are the risk factors uh, which lead to a person developing these uh, super infections or opportunistic infections? Clearly, we know the host factors like advanced age, comorbidities like diabetes, chronic kidney disease, heart disease, COPD, cancers. Most of these people are critically ill, would be admitted to ICUs, may or may not be on mechanical ventilation with multiple uh, lines. Uh, and many of these would be on immunomodulators, use of steroids, IL-6 inhibitors, et cetera. Uh, and clearly, uh, uh, the three lab reports, that's leukocytosis, absolute neutrophil count, and pro-cal level have a significantly high negative predictive value uh, for co-infections if the, all three are within the normal range. But, you know, we keep talking, it may be very easy to differentiate between, uh, uh, you know, define the two as separate, um, the, you know, co-infection and super-infection, but there are a lot of technical problems which are associated when we want to segregate the two or make a diff diagnosis of co-infection. And this lists a lot of such confounding factors, just to name a few, variable diagnostic thresholds of the RT-PCR, uh, variable diagnostic targets for RT-PCR, prolonged amplification test uh, causing uh, po persistent positivity of these tests, asymptomatic infection, changes in respiratory, uh, uh, resident upper respiratory bacteria after viral infection onset, reliance on molecular assays rather than the standard cultures, contamination of samples with the uh, oropharyngeal bacteria, lack of many times confirmative diagnostic tests, big reliance on zero diagnosis, very non-specific uh, immunodiagnostics, um, you know, uh, case definitions, which are not very clear in many conditions. And of course, colonization of lower respiratory tract, uh, especially in patients who are on mechanical ventilator and they may not be having an active infection. So all these are confounding factors which create a problem in uh, uh, or a diagnostic dilemma in these patients with co-infections. Now, this is quoting another study from China where they actually found that most of these uh, so opportunities infections which happen in COVID patients uh, are uh, restricted to three areas. So respiratory tract infections, bloodstream infections, and urinary tract infections in that order. Um, and this particular slide actually shows what the flora uh, uh, on the left side, the blue lines actually depict the distribution of pathogens which are detected in respiratory secondary uh, infections. Um, and you have a spectrum of bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Uh, and on the right side, you see the distribution of various uh, microorganisms which are detected in the bloodstream infection as a part of these secondary infections. And again, the spectrum goes from bacteria to virus to fungi. Now, this is a very interesting slide. You know, um, uh, We have been talking about what are the risk factors for a person developing these uh, uh, secondary infections. This slide actually goes to tell what procedures and what types of supports increase the risk of which type of microorganism. So if you see on the left, I have tried to list certain respiratory support procedures. For example, tracheostomy. Uh, the media, after tracheostomy, the median time to develop an opportunistic infection is around nine days. And if you see that color bar, light blue represents the gram negative bacteria. So there is a higher likelihood of developing opportunistic infections following tracheostomy with gram negative. Uh, similarly, tracheal intubation. The median time for developing an infection is four to 4.5 days, and large majority of these infections are because of gram-negative bacteria. Even high flow nasal uh, uh, cannula causing, giving high flow of oxygens, and sometimes even NRBMs, can be a cause for these secondary infections with a median time of 7.5 days. And again, the causative bugs are generally GMBs. Whereas if you now come to the right side, and here we are trying to list certain in invasive procedures which are done, ECMO, for example, which could be done in a lot of post-COVID patients, the median time to develop an infection after ECMO is around 12 days, but here the spectrum changes, and it is mostly the invasive fungi. Similarly, IVC, central cannulation, uh, median, days, 12, median time is 12 days, and again, if you see the purple, that's the fungi. CRRT, a lot of these patients have acute kidney injury and require a renal replacement therapy. It, this itself uh, uh, can be a reason for developing opportunistic infections, median time around 10 and a half days, and again, a large component is by fungi. So this actually gives you an overview of, and this is a spectrum of various procedures, supports, or treatments 
which are institution uh, given to these patients of uh, severe covid who are admitted to icus and each of these is independently associated with higher risk of gram negative bacterial and fungal infections uh now what's the pathogenesis what actually leads to increased chances of these infections of course damage of ciliated cells because of the virus deterioration of mucociliary clearance because of that and then increased adhesion of these bacteria to the mucin and emergence of new receptors for bacterial adhesion uh, following the death of airway epithelial cells this diagrammatic representation is trying to really tell us how the bacterial super infections and again it is a mechanisms which goes around the local immune responses to the adherence of bacteria because of mucociliary clearance which is reduced uh, to dysregulation of amps ultimately leading to two main things the gut dysbiosis and respiratory tract dysbiosis i think many a times we forget the importance of gut dysbiosis in causing secondary infections especially the bacterial and fungal infections in these already immunocompromised uh, patients so this slide i would not spend too much of time i have already spoken most of the things in the previous diagram but again a big focus i would like to place on role of oral uh, microbiome uh, in causing these secondary infections um, uh, so typically capnocytophagia and valinella and other oral opportunistic pathogens which are many times found in bronchialveolar lavage poor oral hygiene cough increased inhalation under normal and abnormal conditions and mechanical ventilation provide a pathway for this oral microorganisms to enter into the lower respiratory tract and cause respiratory disease which is further compounded by lung hypoxia uh, now neuraminidases producing oral bacteria like streptococcus oralis and mitis uh, strep mitis can also promote release of influenza virus and cell to cell uh, uh, you know spread of infection so that is where the emphasis and focus of effective oral oral, oral health care measures are necessary to reduce these infections especially in severe covid-19 so there is a rationale of focusing on the oral hygiene of these patients now i'll uh, come to the bacterial infections uh, as for one of the first most important uh, super infections or and co infections now first talking about the co infections now these are studies which have shown that nearly 4 to 5% of hospitalized patients have documented bacterial co infections uh, and when do you think a person has a bacterial co infection is productive cough respiratory depression severe immunosuppression and a background radiological findings of a bacterial pneumonia in a person who now presents with covid uh, whereas when we talk of secondary infection or super infection that's generally what we are talking about hap or wrap so in these cases the median time would be about 1 to 2 weeks after hospitalization and most common presentation of these patients is either pneumonia or as bloodstream infection and when do you suspect a secondary or a super infection there is a new or change in character of sputum there is recrudescence of fever after an afebrile period there is a new findings on imaging uh increase oxygen demand after a phase of improvement and neutrophilic leukocytosis these are the situations where you start suspecting that a secondary bacterial infection has happened but this is a study from and i'll be showing some uh, microbiological uh, flora or across various uh, countries and at the end i like to show some brief data from max healthcare but this is a data from our neighboring uh, country uh, uh, pakistan and this is from the western population and there is a significant difference Uh, in the uh, the the flora when we talk of bacterial co infections or super infections in these patients and this is a meta analysis which has clearly shown that patients of covid-19 admitted to hospital or in icus there is a clearly statistically significant uh, presence of co infections of various bacteria in these patients a strong correlation um, and the values uh, is almost uh, 0.04 now essentially how do you then approach these patients with co infections now you have to basically see upon the admission criteria patient is critically ill has severe immunosuppression there are radiological findings and lab findings which favor bacterial infection obviously you do the requisite cultures uh, start these patients on empirical antibiotics which is beta lactam plus atypical cover and may depending upon country uh, you may need to add an anti mrsa treatment but most important thing is you reassess these patients very frequently so that once you have the culture positive you can deescalate the treatment uh, this is as i've already said beta lactam macrolide but most of the rcts have shown that adding macrolide to beta lactam for bacterial co infections in covid 19 is not useful 
except in very critically ill people. Now, th these two slides I would not talk about, but because these were the recommendations from IDSA for VAP and HAP prior to the COVID era, but many of these antimicrobial, antibiotic, antibiotic uh, uh, re regimes and recommendations do stand uh, even in COVID times. So what happens because of these bacterial uh, opportunistic infections? We all know that longer stay, lo need for more need of mechanical ventilation, leading to higher in-hospital mortality in these patients. Very, very important aspect to be touched upon when I talk about the, uh, the bacterial co-infections and super-infections is a rational use of antibiotic. We've seen whether it is a mild case of prescription of azithromycin and doxycycline to a moderate case who's admitted in hospital and invariably on at least second or third generation uh, cephalosporins or maybe higher antibiotic even, uh, even in moderate cases may or may not be on oxygen. To <laughs> Uh, can we have everybody on mute, please? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, and third, of course, is uh, patients on ICU who would be on a multiple combinations of uh, empirical uh, high-end antibiotics and antifungals. So it's very, very important that we uh, use these, uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, the, the uh, as I said, the co-infections may not be so high, but we treat everybody uh, uh, suspecting that everyone has an underlying co-infection. Uh, this is what the WHO has to say. These are 2021 January guidelines. And I have quoted them saying that uh, WHO says that we, should not recommend uh, uh, antibiotics or prophylaxis in patients with mild COVID. We should not uh, recommend antibiotics in people with moderate COVID, whereas in case of severe COVID, what it says, and I'll read this out, the use of empirical antimicrobials to treat all likely pathogens based on clinical judgment, patient host factors, and local epidemiology, and this should be done as soon as possible within one hour of initial assessment, along with taking blood cultures first, and antimicrobial therapy should then be assessed daily for de-escalation. I think de-escalation is what we normally forget. Uh, similarly, if depending upon the regions, if you have malaria suspected patient having fever, please don't shy away from using those. Be rem Remember this fact that many times you have a false negative Vidal and other sero uh, uh, serology tests. So please be cautious of overdiagnosing things like that. Influenza, if your patient happens to be in a time when there's a seasonal uh, uh, outbreak of influenza going on, empirical therapy with a neuraminidase inhibitor like oseltamivir should be considered in these patients. If your patient has coexistent TB, treat him. If your patient has coexistent HIV, treat him for uh, with antiretroviral. So this is what WHO has to say. And I think the final recommendations are empirical antibiotic prescription in confirmed COVID-19 in low risk should be avoided. You should do blood cultures. You should do procalcitonin in these patients. Use them for five to seven days. De-escalate. Stop if a person clinically recovers. A uh, few words on viral infections. Again, this is a forest uh, uh, diagram to show that uh, patients who are admitted with COVID-19 in hospital and in ICUs, there was a highly statistically significant co-infections of these patients with various viruses. Uh, and again, this is the spectrum of various viruses which are isolated uh, from these patients of COVID. And this is a study from West. Uh, uh, influenza A, RSV uh, are very high uh, in this list. And the recommendations do say that if you identify influenza or there's an outbreak of influenza, please do treat these patients with oseltamivir. All cases, as I said, influenza, you should look for and treat them uh, as and when needed. Just an overview of various uh, antiviral treatments uh, for the commonly identified respiratory viruses. I would not go into the detail. This is, again, not specific for COVID, but is generalization for uh, respiratory viral infections. And coming to the most important topic, which is the fungal opportunistic infections, I think this tries, slide tries to list uh, various fungal infections uh, which have been identified in COVID patients. And the terminology now is COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis, COVID-associated candida, COVID-associated mucormycosis, other things like invasive cryptococcus and pneumocystis, and the fungal infections which we don't see commonly in our country, cochidiomycosis, histoplasmosis, and blastomycosis. Now, in this, I would like to bring to the fact that uh, uh, in aspergillus, it is the aspergillus fumigatus which is more common. Now, in uh, candida, what we are seeing uh, in our uh, geographical areas is a very, very high uh, incidence of isolation of Candida auris. Uh, and we know that in our region and elsewhere in the world also Candida auris and Candida glabrata is now largely a multidrug resistant. Uh, we do also isolate cases of paracellosis, 
uh, and Tropicalis, which may be azole resistant. Cruzii, we know, is inherently resistant. Elbicans, uh, these the is become rather an innocent fungus now. Uh, most of the times, although again there is increasing resistance, but what we now see is albicans is the least to be detected when when we do uh, isolate candida. Uh, so the treatment has to be as per uh, you know the local uh, flora and the sensitivity pattern. That's very very important. And just like we had in bacterial illnesses, we need to understand how what increases the susceptibility to fungal infections. It's actually the overexpression of inflammatory cytokines. So cytokine storm actually predisposes to fungal infections. Impaired cell-mediated immunity is a very, very important component. Um, and and uh, uh, in these very sick COVID-19 patients, super added secondary fungal infections sometimes become very difficult to diagnose because of non-specific symptoms. And you must uh, try to get as many diagnostic samples or tests you can to prove and confirm uh, fungal infections in these patients. And of course, very high increased risk of mortality in these patients. Uh, now, again, uh, we have sort of been discussing the risk factors, more or less they remain same for invasive fungal infections. So ARDS in a COVID patient is a risk factor for fungal infection, advanced age, uh, structural lung disease like cystic fibrosis and COPD, patients being admitted in ICU, having received broad spectrum antibiotics, already on immunosuppression, corticosteroids, ventilation, neutropenia, and of course, we know solid organ and hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Again, these are two forest plots. On the left, what you see is, again, trying to show that hospitalized patients with COVID have a high incidence of uh, COVID uh, fungal co-infections and super-infections. And on the right side, uh, especially for aspergillus, again, a highly statistically significant correlation. And this uh, forest plot actually shows that clearly increased statistical uh, relationship of fungal co-infections with mortality. All these are various meta-analysis. Uh, won't now spend too much of time on these. This is what we know as to what is possible, probable, and definitive uh, fungal infections. And I think Dr. Daga may want to take these more uh, during his talk, so I'll skip this slide. Uh, uh, you know, so we are talking of not only superficial uh, skin, uh, superficial uh, fungal infections or oral uh, pharyngeal candidiasis, but we are talking mostly of invasive fungal infections in these patients. So we, when you have a confirmed COVID case, uh, please assess his or her risk of having in, uh, uh, opportunistic fungal infections. Please do remember pneumocystis uh, gyrovisi, uh, which we tend to sometimes forget and we tend to sometimes miss especially in COVID times because of the similarity on the X-ray or the radiology findings of these patients. So certain tests like beta-D, glucan, galactomenin, I think become very, very important in all these patients. Uh, now, just a slide on uh, the uh, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. I think uh, a very pragmatic approach to diagnosis uh, in setting of COVID-19 pneumonia is critical, and one must have a very high index of suspicion in a person who had a diffuse uh, ground glass opacities on the CT, that patient has deteriorated, and you do a CT as is shown on the right side, and now you see a low bar. Uh, consolidation uh, uh, in one of the lobes, uh, which is really not a feature of, of uh, simple uh, COVID uh, pneumonia. And that's where you start suspecting either secondary bacterial pneumonia or a fungal pneumonia. And then, of course, you have those halo signs, et cetera. And you do galactomannan and you do deglucan and you take the cultures and you tend to then we will be able to reach a diagnosis of bacterial versus fungal. But during that time, I think it is very important that we cover these patients empirically with antibiotics and antifungal. And as we know, the drug of choice for aspergillus is of oriconazole. Uh, we now have isavuconazole, which has better pharmacokinetic uh, profile and less drug-to-drug -drug interactions as compared to oriconazole. Remember, remdesivir reduces the bioavailability of oriconazole and to other antifungals also. There is a query uh, role of prophylaxis uh, in form of nebulizing these patients with liposomal amphotericin B who are at a high risk of developing invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. Uh, similarly, now coming to COVID-associated uh, candidiasis, uh, again, this lists all the patients who are, who are at a higher risk of developing uh, candidiasis, uh, diabetes, renal failure, abdominal surgery, catheters, uh, parental nutrition, multiple antibiotics, uh, and, and especially related to COVID, ECMO, steroid use, and 
uh, ARDS. And of course, we know that uh, echinokinins, enadilofungin, caspofungin, mecafungin are the drug of choice. If not working, then you go to amphotericin B. I would not spend uh, uh, time on this slide. This is too congested. But the reason for putting this slide here is to show that invasive aspergillosis, candidiasis, mucormycosis, and cryptococcosis is what one really, really needs to think of in these critically ill patients. Mucormycosis would be a separate talk. And very, very important, this slide, I think, is for clinicians. For us, it is one of the most important slides from radiologically how you can differentiate as to whether the new opacity, it is a diffuse GGOs, unilateral consolidation, or multiple cavities, or multiple nodules or multiple infiltrates, presence of pleural effusion and pneumothorax, and there are different uh, microorganisms which would have a difficult, typical, uh, different typical picture in each of these radiological presentations. So I think this is a very, very important slide for the clinician colleagues of mine. I will not go into the detail of this slide. All it says is, please be cognizant of pneumocystis in these patients and try if to make a diagnosis where you are suspecting if the patient is having hypoxia, which is unexplainable, please even go to doing a bal a bronchoscopy or a biopsy if needed. But at the same time, we've spoken about bacteria, fungi, viruses, Please let's not forget about tuberculosis, uh, coexistent superadded infections in era of using tocilizumab, immunosuppressants, high-dose steroids. Let's also, I've already spoken about pneumocystis. Um, and this is something which is very, very interesting. A person of uh, COVID now develops bilateral nodules, infiltrates, cavitatory lesions. Uh, the uh, sputum is checked uh, and there is a KOH stain which is positive and shows uh, filaments and you do a modified ZN stain and you get these uh, positive filaments. This is a case of nocardia and, and we do occasionally anecdotally get to see and probably can would be reported increasingly now. So these are all clinical situations which we must not forget. And this is a very, very interesting thing which I wanted to put it down while, while I was doing a literature survey. In two patients, they identified saccharomyces in the bloodstream infection. Uh, and they were. it was found that these patients were given probiotics containing saccharomyces in the ICU. And it was that leaky gut which led to translocation of the same saccharomyces from the probiotic which was given into bloodstream infection. So this is a very, very interesting um, you know, uh, insight for me. So I wanted to put it here. And last, I'll spend just last two minutes. Uh, and this was a very initial data uh, from only one of our hospitals last year from May to October, uh, where we tried to identify uh, all the secondary or super infections in COVID patients who were admitted in the hospital and very, very different from the data of the West and other countries. Our data showed most of the, 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 the urinary tract infection being the most prominent site. Uh, next was uh, the pneumonia. After that was bloodstream infection and very small number of skin and soft tissue infections. And this was the microbiological uh, composition of the patients with skin and soft tissue infections, mainly gram negative. This is, I think, would not be a surprise for most of you in the forum, bloodstream infection and the highest causative organism, largest was Candida auris. After that was E. coli, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, but all Candidas are represented in this, if you see, but Candida auris was the most common bloodstream infections in these COVID patients in our series. And this was last year. And I can tell you this wave, this incidence is even more. This is in uh, hospital acquired pneumonia, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, uh, and uh, Candida. And if you see the urinary tract infections, other than E. coli and Klebsiella, again, Candida, Tropicalis, Paracillus, Auris, Al Albicans, and Pseudomonas are very prominent. And I'll, this is my last slide. I just wanted to analyze our mucor cases in wave one and wave two. And if you see the bar on the left side, last year we reported, and this is the data from all hospitals of Max put together. We reported 10 cases of mucor last year with two deaths and till date. And this, we have 136 patients of mucor, 100 presently admitted in our system, 36 discharged, six died. And this is probably in the last two weeks only. Bombay, of course, Nanavati Hospital started seeing it earlier, but this is a huge outbreak which has now happened in the last few days. And I think something all of us now believe and accept that it is there. And it is something which is probably going to worsen over the next two weeks as we are seeing in Maharashtra, which is two weeks ahead of us. Uh, thank you, I'll stop here and uh, we can have the questions at the end. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your valuable insight. 
I see no questions, sir. Right now, very comprehensive talk. Uh, I think we'll take up the Q and A at the end of the three talks. Okay. Uh, so moving on to the next speaker. Allow me some time to share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Okay. So our next speaker, next eminent speaker on board is Dr. Mradul Kumar Daga. He's the director professor, Department of Medicine, MAMSI, and in charge center for occupational and environmental health, Delhi government. His area of expertise is intensive care. Amongst the various feathers in his cap, uh, he's been awarded WHO Fellowship in Critical Care and Pulmonary Medicine at Wayne State University, Michigan, and Emory University, Atlanta. He's, he's uh, the fellow of American College of Chest Physicians, Royal College of Physicians, and Indian College of Physicians. He's on the International Advisory Board on, of our favorite medicine textbook, Davidson's Textbook of Medicine. He's the editor of e-learning book on clinical examination and bedside procedures published by Elsevier. He's on the editorial board of Journal of Respiratory Research, editorial board of Journal of Lung India. He's been awarded the state award for best serving doctors by government of NCT Delhi. More than 250 international and national journal publications to his credit. Sir, so kindly share your in, uh, insight on preparing for diagnosis of opportunistic infections. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Let me share my slide. Just a minute, give me a minute. Just give me a minute. Is it? No, you, uh, the previous uh, slide share has to stop before you can. Yeah, it has stopped. This you have to stop this slide share. Dejani, you have to stop the slide show. Share, slide share from yours. Yeah. Can it? Can you see it now? So to start the slide sharing, yours hasn't started. Can you see it now? Welcome, Doctor Arun. Oh, sir. Not yet, sir. You're not able to see. I'll just share in. Okay, sir. Welcome, Dr. Arun Lok. And hello, Dr. Sanjay. Yeah, okay. I am unmuted. Is it, is it now sharing? Thank you for being here. Hi, Poonam. Not uh, yet, sir. Hi, Sanjay. Sorry, got a little late. Sir. It's okay. Very serious, Dr. Prakash. This. So, well, Dr. Um, Dr. Dagas is trying to share, so I would like to ask one question, which is how much are you expecting cryptococcus to flare up? Well, so that, that's a very interesting question because we uh, do see cryptococcus more often uh, on an annual basis in our immunocompetent hosts. Uh, every year, I see more often cryptococcus than mucor in normal times. But in so far in COVID era, I have not seen a single cryptococcus. Uh, uh, so I really don't know. And I just do hope that it doesn't uh, show up. Uh, it's probably it's that one opportunistic infection really suppresses the other. Maybe that's the reason why mucor has just sort of not let cryptococcus come in. I don't know. Are you able to see it? <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, uh, Yes, sir. So Please, Matt. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I think most of my work has been done by Sandeep, uh, and I did not really prepare much for this. Uh, I've just prepared it today. So I, please bear with me uh, for my deficiencies. Uh, what I wanted to uh, share about uh, is I wanted to start with a case. And so we had a 59-year-old male admitted known diabetic and hypertensive on regular medications, uh, came with acute shortness of breath for two to three days, gradually progressive, dry cough since uh, three, four days, 
uh, generalized weakness, his RT-PCR was positive. He was not a known case of any other disease except, I mean, he had diabetes and hypertension and he was uh, not an alcoholic or a smoker. Uh, so when he came, his respiratory rate was 22, his saturation was 88 on oximetry. But uh, once put on a venturi mask, we could see that he had uh, uh, improved to 98%. Uh, parameters were not that bad. And he had, uh, he had uh, evidence of pneumonia clinically. When we did some investigation right at the beginning, we found that there were elevated leukocyte count, markers were raised, even procalcitonin was high and even serum, serum lactate was more than 2.1. So he had come from other facility. Uh, doing well for next two, three days, we had started on presumptive antibiotic, thinking that there is a leukocytosis, procal high, uh, some evidence of acidosis on ABG and uh, lactic acid being more than 2.3. Uh, he's doing well, and suddenly one fine morning, we find that he's uh, become unconscious, he's not responding. Uh, when we did a neurological examination, we found that there is evidence of meningitis. Uh, we did a CT scan, we showed some non-specific changes in lacunar infarct, and a lumbar puncture was done, which was suggestive of a bacterial meningitis. As you can see, uh, we could grow E. coli from the CSF culture. Uh, sensitive to cholestine and linezolid only. We had put him on initially Ceftriax on, but we switched him over to cholestine and meropenem. Uh, and we gave presumptively vancomycin as well. Uh, subsequently, the investigation on, day, on the day of his this conversion were again showing the markers much high, the counts very high. And uh, next three days after the switch over antibiotic, he improved and he came out with this illness. So uh, if you want to see the chest radiographs, there wasn't really significant uh, difference again between one and two. You can see on the left side, the shadows had increased. Uh, on other hand, if you look into another case who got admitted, uh, was having uh, some body ache symptoms for uh, five to six days before getting admitted and uh, he was getting all those cocktail drugs which is commonly being prescribed uh, and some investigations done were essentially normal and as it happens that many people are getting the HRCT done and the score was 9 by 25. Seeing that report, a physician outside started dexamethasone and anticoagulant despite saturation being all right. Uh, they increased the dose next day because of increase in cough and fever. And uh, another antibiotic was added to azithromycin, which he had, was already continuing. On 3rd May, the patient was hospitalized because he, we, he had hypoxia. Uh, on hospitalization, uh, antibiotics in form of Tajact, methylprednisolone at very high dose, Clexin, Pemdesivir, Plasma, Everything was started within a span of two days. Uh, cultures were sent. Uh, and on day, say two days after that, when the oxygen was not improving, uh, another antibiotic was added, levofloxacin. Uh, fluconazole was added. Uh, all the cultures were negative. Procal was 0 0.04. Again, let me show you. Sorry, just a second. It's again got struck. There is some issue with. Uh, anyhow, the bottom line with this case was that uh, uh, the patient did this patient really need all these drugs? with this kind of scenario. So these are the two different kind of scenarios we are being seeing in this uh, 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 wave of COVID-19. And uh, the, the, the basic question when we get these patients in our facility, let me see why it got struck up. The basic question we ask ourselves is that 
are we doing the right thing there are two issues which i think i'll show in the next slide that uh, either the uh, patients coming to us from different facility are already overloaded with antibiotics or they are coming with coexisting infection as uh, sandeep was talking about so what is the scenario how do we distinguish between a co-infection present at the time of admission vis-a-vis -vis a super infection so a lot of studies which have been done have shown that yes so now it started working so this was a person who we were talking about this was the ct scan with which the patient came there wasn't much much evidence of pneumonia there is uh, on admission, this is the x-ray. And subsequently, this is the x-ray, which you can see. So we know from a lot of studies now that, uh, that mean antibiotic use in these patients is very high. 75% of the patients who, patients who get admitted are put on antibiotics in hospital. And uh, amongst the pe people who received antibiotics, only 18% they could prove that there was some infection. So uh, the problem with this study was, this is the retrospective analysis. There was variable testing. There was a limited RT-PCR test for other pathogens, viral pathogens. And initially all of them had received antibiotics. So as Sandeep said that we do find bacterial co-infection in three to 4% or sometimes even seven to 8% of the patients on admission. And secondary bacterial infection is the tune of 10 to 15%. And if you are a mechanically ventilated, you separately take a group, the infection rate may be pretty high in there. Similarly, another study you find that uh, median time of developing a secondary bacterial infection is from 13 to 19 days. And most of them still have not significant leukocytosis. So the key questions are, what are the risk of bacterial infection in hospitalized COVID-19 patients? What are the bacterial pathogens which he has been elucidated? And how do you diagnose the bacterial infection? So we need to know between a primary bacterial infection and a secondary infection. And that has been elucidated by him. The primary infection is one who develops in an individual, healthy individual. A secondary infection that develops in is healthy, infected with a different uh, infective agent. And we also need to distinguish between colonization, inapparent or subclinical infection, and symptomatic infection. So here comes the role of a very clear and crisp assessment at the bedside on history and looking into all the existing parameters because we need to know that the normal flora, which is absent, notably absent in most all internal organs, they are absent in all these areas, whether it is meninges, pericardium, peritoneum, CSF, blood, low respiratory tract. So anything you isolate from there, you would think that you are dealing with some kind of a secondary bacterial infection or acquired infection. This is very, very important. And then what are the tests we have routinely available with us? We know we have evidence in form of repeated cultures we do. And I'm not going into nitty gritty of say two different site cultures or three different cultures or a gap, how frequently you take that culture that is well-defined and everyone knows that. Uh, do we have, what is the time between culture collection and reaching the lab? So all those areas are very, very critical. And despite best of facilities, we all know that at best of the centers, the isolation from blood culture varies from 20 to 40%, from other cultures also variable. So one has to take not only culture sine con as your diagnostic modality, but overall clinical picture, including leukocytosis or leukopenia, or a sudden appearance of a new radiological uh, sign or worsening of a patient clinically and anticipating some rare opportunistic infection from you talking in terms of either uh, uh, the common what you see with uh, HIV patients 
or you look into some other immunocompromised patients where you detect nocardia. But still, the most common pathogens which we isolate are gram-negative bacteria and to some extent, fungi. So we have variety of diagnostic tests to detect influenza. We have point of care assay test. We have moderately complex, which require clinical laboratory and highly complex, which require very, I mean, uh, laboratories which are accredited and not present in every center in our country. What we rely upon is on antigen detection. We also rely upon on rapid immunoassays and also sometimes the direct fluorescent antibody staining. And these all have low to moderately high sensitivities. They may have high specificity to detect influenza uh, comparison to nucleic acid detection assays. And we also know the limitations or the tests which we now employ for detection of most of the viral pathogens, also sometimes bacterial pathogens. So the timing, the period in which we will get that, these are very, very critical. Having said that, uh, the, the issue is, what do we detect? What are the kind of accuracies we have with them? Whether we're trying to detect influenza A. And what we have noticed surprisingly is that during this pandemic, the influenza has been much, much less in these patients to the tune of some of the studies are talking only five to 10% of the patients having a co-infection with the influenza virus. Some say that it is much, much less. We haven't seen high number of H1N1, seasonal or other influenza illness occurring together. Either we are missing them out because we are not testing for them, or even if we are testing for them, uh, probably we are not uh, doing it at the right moment. So we need to know that what are the sensitivity, what is the specificity of these tests when we apply. And these are what you find that when you do a meta-analysis of influenza molecular assays from 30 studies, the sensitivity is around 88% and specificity is around 98%. Similarly, for this novel coronavirus, we find that there are many other LRIs, which are influenza, adenovirus, syncytial virus, or typical bacterial for uh, uh, community acquired pneumonia with the strep cocci or the atypical, or even a bronchitis when you have body tela or mycoplasma. So we need to remember that this may be there and we need to, I think in between there is some issue with my slide sharing. It's, yeah. So, we find that even during the SARS and MERS, when there was high mortality, uh, we find that uh, most of these patients had, uh, you had the travel history, you had, uh, sorry, with this COVID now, you had the travel history, exposure and symptoms, you have person under investigation, there was no specific finding at that time. We were having hypoxia, happy hypoxia last year when the wave started and we had these certain signs of tachypnea and uh, tachycardia in these patients. But one of the important things which we have now learned in the COVID time is all these, which we have, I think Sandeep has already talked about uh, for diagnosing these patients of COVID. But the, the bottom line is uh, that in addition to diagno diagnosing COVID, the, the problem is about when you are applying these PCR tests for different viruses, or for that matter, even if you're doing a mycoplasma antigen test or an antibody test, they, you, they, you may be mixing up these things. And when we say that there is a coexisting infection, it is quite possible that the patient landed up in your emergency, he already had a mycoplasma infection, which was not detected. And on top of that, he's developed a COVID pneumonia. And there is some issue with so the big question is, is there high co-infection rate in COVID-19? What are the limitations in current diagnostic methods? Because if you employ amplification technology like PCR, they do not necessarily confirm a live pathogen unless you do a quantification. There is significant laboratory variation. 
lot of time the commensal organisms are not excluded and concurrent serodiagnosis is an area of great concern we know that association of these quite less during this influenza season and in during early covid disease we had more common with uh, bacteria rather than with coexisting virus in the covid scenario and late infection we all know would occur because of nosocomial and opportunistic bacteria and other fungi and other thing misuse of antibiotics immunomodulatory agents steroids blood products and the invasive procedures we do i think this uh, uh, sandeep has already talked about this is the bottom line the problem with whatever te techniques we are using there are a lot of variations in that and when you are applying zero diagnostic methods in low prevalence situation you may not be picking up the infections very properly and variation in quality of diagnostic samples as well as the case definition which you follow is very very critical for diagnosing so because one study found 96% of the patients with covid had a uh, covirus infection so that's a huge that's an initial study from china so detection or co diagnosis does not amount to co infection what you need is a genome analysis and that is a major issue in low middle middle income country because either you under or over diagnose by doing this and causes for high frequency of co infections is you have a variation in diagnostic methods and partial genome amplification with quantitative value is not done and what are the pitfalls for genomic amplification because diagnostic serology is igm is non specific a detection of viral antigens also is an issue it is observer dependent and sensitivity is variable like mycoplasma 50% zero positivity was seen in in covid in one series and again there may be high false positive rates there or like rheumatoid arthritis may be a potential confounder so you had a patient with rheumatoid arthritis you may have falsely positive uh, mycoplasma igg ig uh, antibodies positive now for blood stream infection a single blood stream positive uh, culture is good enough uh, if we find that you are able to correlate your isolation with a local isolation that will be very important but for low respiratory tract ball would be ideal or a bronchoscopic method would be ideal but you have to see along with that the clinical and radiological picture so if you have co coexisting bacterial infection you have to see that many times it is hospital admission which has led to not the co infection but it is the super infection or because of the immunosuppressants or misuse of lot of antibiotics uh but this was not really ensure a co cause and effect relationship because another study from michigan found that 60% of the bacteria found by amplification assays were not correlated with the culture results subsequently in this set of patients so the most critical point is that we have lost that art of correlation between microscopic smear examination and semi quantitative bacteriology where we can see white blood cells in that sample and we can be very sure that there is a definite infection here rather than a false positive evidence i think for uh, uh, aspergillosis i would skip that very busy slide i mean uh, diagnostic methods are very very clear but a word about procalcitonin i would say it is misused or overused or not used what we need to know that the values may not rise in lot of bacterial infections to begin with which may vary from atypical bacteria to fungus to viri virus it may probably never be and what is more important is that if there are certain toxin mediated illnesses the rise may be seen then there are other conditions like severe physiological stress or immunological disorders or lot of inflammatory diseases where you may have that falsely elevated so just taking procalcitonin as your independent marker would be incorrect and you have to see that these lot of other conditions even using drugs 
even sometimes using interleukin or rituximab, all these may be causing rise in uh, procalcitonin. So you have to be very, very careful uh, when you are using this. So evidence so far suggests that you need to have a restrictive antibiotic use in stewardship. Maximum effort should be obtained to, op to do the sputum, blood, and low respiratory tract and urinary I mean, uh, uh, cultures, including urinary antigen for pneumococcal. Please stop antibiotics if cultures are negative, antigen negative, and procalcitonin is normal after hospitalization. Do follow the guidelines for other pneumonias or hospital acquired or ventrally associated pneumonias and restrict the use for minimum of days rather than continuing it for days together. So I wanted to say to summarize that there is still a low rate of new bona fide viral co-infection in early COVID-19. High rate cited in studies due to limitation in current diagnostic methods. However, in severe COVID-19, opportunistic and nosocomial infections will occur due to prolonged and intense nature of the disease, the cytokine storm, ICU, use of steroids, invasive procedures, and despite diagnostic challenges, we need to be very judicious in using antibiotics. Uh, and prophylactic antibiotics are a big, big no in patients with moderate disease or patients com not coming from other facility, coming from home, you have to be very, very careful because they have already received not one, two, but three antibiotics in their OPD prescriptions, which you see with this doxycycline, azithromycin, and sometimes even second generation cephalosporine. So you have to be very, very careful. But I just wanted to add with this that the clinician judgment and sending samples in right perspective at right time, but simultaneously, if you are able to use your methods of microscopic examination of sample sand to get to an early diagnosis, which we are probably not doing right now, so that you can de-escalate or increase antibiotics or antibiotics can be stopped is very, very critical. We do not have new diagnostic methods. We still, yes, we do have culture methods of multi dof and others where you can have uh, early diagnosis, but the sample has to reach in, you reach in time Proper collection of the sample is very, very critical. And you also have to avoid contamination of the sample. And you have to see the flora. And a hospital should have its own antibiogram to know is it no right time. or not. That's what I wanted to say in my presentation. Thank you very much. I'm so Thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful presentation. There are a few questions in the chat box. Uh, Poonam, ma'am, uh, do we address them right now? or at no, the We'll end of... take it at the end because we're kind of short on time. We'll take it at the end together. Yeah, we'll, we'll take it in the panel discussion. I'm sure Dr. Daga will yes. be here. Yes. OK. So moving on, uh, allow me some time to share my screen. Dr. Daga, sir, please. Stop the screen share. Okay, that's it. Yeah, I stopped it. I have not said she is still stopping. Okay, moving on uh, to the next presentation by Dr. Orunalok Chakraborty, Chairman Clinical Microbiology, PGI Chandigarh. Sir, uh, he needs no official introduction, professor and head of department at my, uh, PGI. Chandigarh, India. He's also the president of International Society for Human and Animal Mycology. He's also the head of National Mycology Reference Laboratory, India. His laboratory has been upgraded as the center of advanced research in medical mycology and is the only WHO collaborating center for reference and research on fungi of medical importance. He also leads the national culture collection of pathogenic fungi. He is the chair of Fungal Infection Study Forum of uh, the country and Asian Fungal Working Group. He is the coordinator of two ESHAM working groups, Fungal Rhinosinusitis and ABPA in asthma. He has contributed in providing domain knowledge and technical support to improve the standard of diagnostic mycology in India. 
His major area of interest is in the field of fungal rhinosinusitis, mucor mycosis, nosocomial fungal infections, and allergic lung infections. He serves as the editor, associate editor, deputy editor of journals, Medical Mycology, Medical Mycology Case Report, Journal of Medical Microbiology, Mycosis, and Current Fungal Infection Reports. Sir, over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me here. Uh, truly speaking, the main challenge of speaking out here is the current deluge in case of mucormycosis uh, along with COVID. I was thinking to take the Dr. Buddhiyaja slide in case of Max. It already had shown what is the deluge. Where was the 10 cases and where it had gone to 136 cases. Friends, some of the slides which you may see have, uh, which we might have seen earlier, but I can assure you in every lecture, there would be some new slides which are there. So friends, this is the deluge which was there every paper, every day, they are speaking about this mucormycosis. And if you see on uh, union government in Delhi High Court on 20th, sorry, May, it's now 20th January, 20th May, they have mentioned that they have got 7,250 cases, possibly more than 10,000. My international colleagues could not believe such a high incidence can be there in case of mucormycosis. So this is the first time mucormycosis has become a notifiable disease in India. Now, again, every time I try to say it's not a black fungal disease, it's not a black fungal disease. Black fungus is here. This is that having the dematitious fungi, having got the melanin pigment on its surface and mucor is never black. Of course, when there is necrosis that can produce some Asia formation which may appear black, but mucor should not be called as black fungi. So people are, uh, it's not a difficult name to call mucormycosis. Why people are afraid and they just try to say black fungi, now white fungi, all these are happening. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to, I know that this crowd is much well versed about this aspect that what are the clinical presentation and what are the risk factors. So what we are seeing now with this deluge is the rhino or cerebral type, which is more commonly with the uncontrolled diabetes. But I would say, please try to look into the pulmonary variety, though it's seen more commonly in case of hematologic malignancy who are on chemotherapy or transplant patients who are on immune suppression, but in, even in COVID patient, we have seen this type of disease. At the beginning, I like to stress on this aspect that mucormycosis in India is different from the rest of the world. The reason is already before COVID, we have reported that we have got 70 times higher incidence and the prevalence of this disease is much higher because of this uncontrolled diabetes, which is the major risk factor. Though, over the recent years, we have seen there is increasing number of cases in case of the hematologic malignancy and transplant group, but uncontrolled diabetes is such a huge in number, it overshadows all other risk factors. That's why before COVID even, we used to have rhinocerebral mucormycosis as the most common variety. We also see high number of cases of gastrointestinal mucormycosis and isolated renal mucormycosis in immunocompetent host is an unique entity, is a unique entity for India. I'm not going to go in those because it is the deluge which I have to present. And here I would like to also stress that spectrum of mucorous causing infection is wide, of which rhizopus aegeus is the most common. And the rare agents only we see in India, there are many. That's a very interesting picture in case of mucor. So let's start coming in or discuss in the issue of the COVID associated mucormycosis. I say that there are two issues are playing. One is the COVID versus diabetes. Another thing is that having the high glucose level, how it is playing in case of mucormycosis. So first coming to this complex link between COVID and diabetes, 
I would say that diabetes is seen in the Western world and many literature showed that amongst COVID-19 patients, this was 7 to 21%, but in India, the incidence is much higher. Many patients in India don't know they are diabetic. That you know already that always people are scared to do the blood sugar level. They don't like to leave sweets because we have got always sweet teeth and they are never tested. So sometimes we may falsely recognize because of the COVID, they have new onset diabetes. Of course, there are some cases honestly seen as new onset because of the COVID, but you must also take care of this issue. Second important factor is that the COVID virus may affect the beta cell pancreas. There are several indirect evidence already have been shown by showing the S2 receptor and many other issues in their his autopsy series, which predicts that possibly COVID-19 affect the beta cell pancreas. Also COVID virus indirectly affect the insulin production because it affects the micro blood vessels supplying to the pancreas, beta cell die, and that is also an important issue in case of COVID. Now, steroid also raises the blood sugar. That is the major issue today. Steroids not only raises the blood sugar, it also causes the impairment of the neutrophil migration, ingestion, and we see this macrophage phagolysis malfunction. So it is having both way uh, damaging in case of the weapon against this mucor in that sense. Also, this is the fourth thing which is happening, the stress-related hormone, because of the acute illness and inflammation, we see cortisol and adrenaline increases that is also causing hyperglycemia. Now, if you have this hyperglycemia, what would happen in that scenario? Let's see. One is that you see that inflammation, this inflammatory state is because of hyperglycemia. Additionally, the antiviral immunity to COVID also causing this inflammatory state. So this causing the alteration in iron metabolism. You know, in severe COVID, IL-16 also stimulates the ferritin synthesis and that down regulates the iron export. So there is a hyperferritinemic syndrome. And this excess intracellular iron causing the reactive oxygen species to come out and damaging the tissue and because of that, free iron comes out. Oh, when free iron comes out, it's a deluge for the mucor because mucor love to eat iron. It has syrup on its surface, which picks it up. Next important issue is the endothelitis issue. This two autopsy series has very clearly shown that there is increased amount of vascular endothelial injury. And this injury is much higher than the influenza H1N1. So this endothelitis helps the mucor to enter in it. I'll show this how GRP78, which is endothelial receptor glucose regulator protein, that is in the endothelial cells, how it is being upregulated and mucoral receptor, which is having cottage, they really perfectly join together and help in case of penetration. Look at this carton. Because of the high glucose, free iron, and cetaphor, there is first the endoplasmic reticulum stress is there, which ultimately this GRP78 upregulates. And here is the cottage receptor, which is seen in Rhizopus oryzae, and this really helps in case of first cellular damage and then entry of the epithelial cell. So ultimately what is happening because of this entry, there is thombus which is happening in the blood. And because of that, we are seeing ischemia and hypoxia. So this is the thing which is happening in case of the rhinocerebral mucormycosis. Now, look at this situation. In India, compared to many other countries, whenever we have looked into the mucoral spores, both in case of the indoor and outdoor environment, the spore counts have been found to be much higher. And these spores, they enter via the respiratory tract, generally which happens. But in case of the COVID, what is additionally is there? There is diabetic issue and that is the steroid issue. Especially people using more than six milligram dexa per day, that is a major issue. And already I've mentioned the ferritin issue which is coming in case of the COVID and endothelitis. 
So all these factors together, ultimately developing this COVID associated mucormycosis. But how much is the immune dysregulation is playing the role? We are still not clear, but we know that there is some alteration in T and B cell activity, which we are studying at present, how it can govern also in case of mucormycosis. So with this understanding, whatever we have at present about the pathogenesis of the disease, look into the clinical situation. Last year, when we used to see occasional case report about mucormycosis, suddenly there was a, a series published from uh, Bengaluru from my friend, Dr. Virus Robi Sethi. Three of the uh, eye centers together published 18 cases in COVID. So that really uh, started, we started thinking, is there any problem of this? So we, what we did is that we collected the data across the world. What we found that nearly two thirds of the cases came from India. Uncontrolled diabetes and systemic corticosteroids were the major predisposing factor. Rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis was the frequent presentation. You know, rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis, which can be easily diagnosed and quickly treated, then mortality in general suggested to be not more than 10 to 15%. But in this series, already we found that the mortality is 50% because the patients were coming late to the doctors. Now, we conducted a study then in September to December 2020. Most likely this paper is going to come next week in uh, emerging infectious disease. What we had done, we collected the data from the 16 centers. What we found, 287 cases. Out of this, 187 was the COVID-associated mucormycosis. 100 were non-COVID-associated mucormycosis. We have looked to those, cent those centers, also the data of 2019. So in the similar months in case of 2019, what we found, there is an increase of around twofold or more than twofold, which is there. Possibly now it is almost nearly 50 folds increase which have been there. Why I'm saying you, like our center used to see mucormycosis maximum in the country, we used to see 50 cases over one year. And people used to say, oh, 50 cases in a year. Now within last five days, we have more than 50 cases, 52 cases, new cases of mucormycosis. So five days versus 365 days. So deluge is of course there. Now, COVID associated mucormycosis has been seen more in the older patient and 80% of them are in the COVID associated, they are male. What we have seen is that COVID associated mucormycosis prevalence when you look into all COVID patients treated in those hospitals, we found that its prevalence was not very high at time 0.27 possibly it has gone up. 1.6% those who are treated in ICU. And if you look into these cases, mostly they were the nasoorbital uh, orbital mucormycosis. Around a quarter of the patients, there was already brain involvement. So there is a delay by the time the patients came to the hospital. 8.6% were pulmonary and 2.1% were disseminated disease, which have been seen. Interestingly, you see that diabetes was nearly two-third only. One-third was not diagnosed to be diabetic. And steroid, of course, was more commonly used in this COVID patient. And what we have seen very interesting part is that COVID alone was the underlying disease in one quarter of uh, one third of the patients. And here the steroid is playing the major role. So steroid are either these are the new onset diabetes. Uh, new onset diabetes or something, uh, some problem is there, uh, which is already not diabetes being diagnosed and they are now going up and it is being diagnosed. So this was the picture which I've seen. Next important thing, what we observed is here. Majority of the CAM patient or the COVID-19 mucormycosis were diagnosed more than eight days. And median was the 18 days after COVID diagnosis. That's very important fact. So when you like to see, so this is the waterfall figure and you see very few patients in the early part. Most of the patients here, 18 is the median which is being there. So mostly if you see the patients are discharged, they are coming back with the COVID 
uh, associated mucomycosis. This slide you have never seen, and this is the very important slide. I would say that when multivariate analysis had been done, hypoxia due to COVID-19 was found to be one of the important risk factors. But this is very important, at least glucocorticoid use. You see only appropriate glucocorticoid use was 36.7%. And nearly 70% or 65% where glucose was either not indicated or if indicated, it is inappropriately high dose. Appropriate means dexamethasone 6 milligram per day for 10 days. Not indicated means any steroid used for managing non-hypoxemic COVID-19 subjects and indicated by, but inappropriately higher dose means more than 6 milligram dexa per day. So it shows that very clearly. Now you cannot say that it is not because of this steroid. A lot of people try to bring a lot of other theories but this study had shown very clearly that is the most important factor. Now, how to diagnose? Rhinoarbito cerebral is very easy. You just need an ENT surgeon to collect the sample. It comes to a microbiology lab within half an hour to one hour. It can be given the report that there is presence of mucormycosis. Radio imaging is important to say about that uh, if there is, what is the extent of the disease. But where we like the problem? That is in case of pulmonary mucormycosis because you have to differentiate from COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis. And here there's symptoms and signs are non-specific. Even the imaging are overlapping with the COVID-19 patients. You like to collect the BL sample transbronchial biopsy or the CT-guided biopsy, but we need a good pulmonologist who is daredevil to collect the sample because People usually avoid in COVID-19 to collect such sample. If you are depending on the imaging, reverse hollow sign, thick wall cavity, multiple nodule, pleural effusion, these are signs. Uh, these are the imaging signs in case of COVID-19. Uh, sorry, in case of mucormycosis. But even in COVID-19, in immunodeficient, you can see reverse hollow sign. Cavity lung lesion can also be present in COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis. So ultimately, we have to rely on this aspect, negative report of galactomannan, beta diglucan, or if you are doing standardized aspergillus PCR, which is being needed. Friends, this is another interesting observation. Around 5% of the cases now, we have seen also uh, Dr. Atul Patel in case of Amidabad has seen that the patients have both aspergillus and mucor in this, I don't know, what is the observation in all India Institute? Dr. Ima is here. She may tell about it, but this is very important. So you have to cover a drug which gives both coverage to aspergillus and mucor. When and how to suspect COVID associated mucormycosis? That's a very important point. Initial symptoms and signs you have to think about and tell the patient. Nasal blockage, congestion, nasal discharge, facial, one-sided facial pain, numbness or swelling. This really gives a very important picture to the uh, patients when they should immediately report. This time, first, we have also seen in quite a number of centers have reported loosening of the maxillary. That's very important. I don't want any patient to report with this blood or double vision. That means it's already it had affected the orbit. That is not a good thing. In pulmonary mucormycosis, again, I say that Generally, the symptoms or signs are very non-specific. Again, it is the repeated negative galactoman and beta diglucan which helps. Now, this is another thing which we have tried to put to you. That is in case of treatment. There are a lot of controversy you may raise about it. But friends, when we have no drug, we had to work from the fungal infection study forum. And we even have taken the opinion of the international people from mycosis study group and also from the people from Europe. First thing is that in case of treatment of COVID associated mucormycosis, you need to do the diabetic control. You need to reduce the steroid or eliminate steroid, discontinue the immunomodulator. You need the extensive surgical debridement. If I involve, please don't uh, be merciful. 
Exentation of the eye is very important in that situation. A lot of people are thinking that they can preserve the eye. That's a very dangerous thing. It would come with the recurrence if it is already eyes get involved. In lung, it is localized or one lobe involved, then you can possibly do. But in case of medical therapy, that is the major issue which I like to discuss here. Friends, liposomal amputation B, if it is there, I have no problem. Give five milligram liposome amputation B, three to six weeks, that is the ideal situation. But we all know what is the present scenario. When lipid amputation B not available, we are suggesting to try with this amputation B deoxycholate. And this amputation B deoxycholate, some of the people have found they can use it quite well if they give it slow infusion. If polyene not available and they're intolerant to polyene, then go for isabuconazole or posaconazole. Now, if there is no polyene, no isabu, no posaconazole, this is the first time we tried or recommended that possibly you have to go for itraconazole. But here again, I would say that if you can get suspension of itraconazole child, for this recommendation, I really had to work hard and convince all my colleagues, then only we could recommend it. If there is stable disease, go for isabuconazole or posaconazole. If progressive disease, if on amputation B, either you raise amputation B or shift to isabuconazole, posaconazole. If on azole, consider adding polyene, but you need those adjustments and all those that should be also there. Therapeutic drug monitoring may be an important factor. If toxicity, shift to the azole. And shift to isabuconazole if there is drug interaction issue is there with posaconazole. There's misinformation misleading already said of black fungi. This particular thing, I don't know where from people have started thinking, they are saying that mucormycosis contiguous disease. I say no, no. Mucormycosis is not contiguous. It does not spread from one person to another. No antifungal prophylaxis, please. There are so many people are giving antifungal prophylaxis when we don't have the drug. Anywhere when we have more than 10% in COVID cohort, then only think about it. It is not that much. So please don't misuse the drug. Avoid those, those escalation in amputation B during therapy. You have to give on the very first day the dose which is required. Voriconazole, fluconazole, echinocandine, and fibrocytosin are not effective against, echino, against mucolins. Combination of antifungal therapy, please don't try with it. Lot of people are giving both drugs as there is little evidence to support the combination of therapy, we have to preserve the drug. How to prevent, you know, glucose control and steroid, that is very important issue already I've discussed. I would say that oral steroids are contraindicated in patients with normal oxygen saturation. If you have to give steroid, please go up to six milligram deska, not beyond that. I would say that our environment having got mucorels, so please use universal masking. If you are susceptible, just get out of COVID. Even in the house, use universal masking. During discharge of the patient, advice about the early symptoms and signs of mucormycosis so that patients can come. So friends, summarizing, what I tried to tell you is that COVID-associated mucormycosis should be suspected in diabetic patients. Tocizulamab, a lot of people ask me, I found that there are two papers which have very clearly shown that tocizolamide has negative impact on hyperglycemia. So with the use of tocizolamide, you can see candida and aspergillus, but at least possibly not mucormycosis. Steroids not given indiscriminately, that is very important issue. Suspect the disease early, that is very important. Friends, these are the uh, mortality risk factor on multivariate analysis, older age, diabetic, ICU admission, and glucocorticoid therapy. So you need to be cautious. Other than rhinocerebral, the diagnosis is a challenge. So possibly we need some molecular diagnosis there. Early diagnosis and prompt therapy are essential to minimize mortality. And cost of treatment is also a very important challenge in India. We are not thinking only the patients who are being treated in high corporate hospital. Think about the common man. I have seen today one of the patients 
who could not afford even a uh, conventional amputation be so think about because when we did study this 2020 which we have published multicentric study we found 25% patient they left the hospital because when they explained about the cost of the antifungal therapy thank you very much for your kind attention thank you so much sir for beautifully elaborating on the subject Uh, due to paucity of time, uh, we'll be taking up queries after the panel discussion. We'll proceed with the panel discussion now. Dr. Pr Pratibha, kindly take over the proceedings. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dejani, and I welcome all the speakers and all the delegates again uh, for the uh, panel discussion today. So, basically, uh, the idea behind this webinar was. the rise of titans and yes definitely we have seen the rise of opportunistic infections india being the diabetic capital of the world also today's date we are the covid capital of the world as well so definitely we are going to see many more opportunistic infections we have begun with mucormycosis because of the horrid presentation however in future days we are going to expect some cytomegalovirus or tb or cryptosporidiasis or histoplasmosis and variety of them so the basic aim of this panel discussion today is to make us all aware about what could be the ne near future of these opportunistic infections and definitely Uh, what all infections are already being experienced by our eminent panelist and how to prevent them or how to early diagnose them and how to have a public uh, health perspective of these opportunistic infections so for this we have uh, our eminent uh, panelist today uh, amongst which we have dr achal gulati who is the professor of excellence of ent at molana azad medical college he is also the president medical assessment and rating board of the national medical commission he has been the director of gb panth hospital director principal of bsa medical college as well here he has also served as additional director general of health services and his speciality area has been head and neck surgery and endoscopic sinus surgery uh, also medical education and curriculum development so definitely uh, sir is going to guide us on uh, the respiratory or the ent associated infections that could be see, associated with covid Our next panelist is Dr. Prakash Shastri, who is the Vice Chairman, Critical Care and Emergency Medicine at Sir Gangaram Hospital. Uh, he is an uh, eminent anesthesiologist at uh, Indian Society of Anesthetists and also an active member of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, where he has been the member executive, secretary, and also the editorial board member of Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine. in the panel we also have dr sanjay dhavan who is the senior director and head of ophthalmology basically when we are speaking of mucormycosis we should have an overview of the ophthalmological aspect also so welcome sir and we have dr imakulata zes from professor microbiology in charge mycology at aims new delhi and she has been working on cryptococcus invasive fungal infections candida infections histoplasmosis uh, so definitely uh, perspective from ma'am is also going to be helpful for us today and joining this uh, panel we also have uh, mk daga sir whom we have heard just uh, before this uh, panelists and definitely chakravarti sir is also going to join us uh, for this panel discussion and so we are getting lot many questions so we are going to uh, uh, just bombard this panel with so many questions and uh, also i welcome the moderator for the panel discussion uh, dr poonam lamb molumba ma'am who is the, the member secretary of the imm delhi chapter so welcome all and let's start with the panel discussion poonam can you yes. Everybody, can you mute? So it is up? mute. The all muted is somebody who is unmuted himself. Uh, can we just request everybody to please mute themselves? Something is cooking somewhere. Someone is cooking food somewhere, and we are not invited. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for being here, and uh, Dr. Sandeep, I would request you to please stay for the panel discussion because there are plenty of unanswered questions. So starting first of all, Dr. Achal, you are the like I mean the the. the most important person right now so can you tell us your experiences of covid being in mamsi which is a huge center and has been a 15 1700 bed hospital in both the pandemics and both the wave sorry so one is what is your experience second thing is i would like to ask you what when exactly would you kind of suspect uh, infections after covid has started and third what are the warning signs 
uh, thank you Poonam for letting me be over here. You know, somewhere down the line, if you analyze it, uh, we had a difference over a spectrum of presentation, what we had in the first wave, the current wave, and it's something like rising from the phoenix, you know, the ashes, the phoenix was rising from the ashes. And when it rose, it caught us unaware. It's not that we uh, should not have anticipated, but our issue which came across was that did we make some issues in the management? Could we scare the patients? Patients were more scared in the second wave. There was absence of availability of beds over there. There was absence of availability of a hospital over there. Self-medication with steroids, overexposure to the uh, media and the social uh, media. So all these things brought together a rampant use of steroids. They were life-saving. But you know, in the hands of a fool, when you give a you give a monkey a stick, he doesn't really know what to do with that. So somewhere down the line, could that be one of the precipitating factors? But having said that, we do have the fact over here that we are facing a problem which is much more than uh, anticipated. You see, the thing is, fungus has been existing for a long time, time memorial. Even if you go back into the times of the uh, the Egyptian mummies over there, evidence of fungus being invaded in the maxillary sinuses has been existing. It's there in our day-to-day -day life, it is there in our atmosphere, but then the situations have so much warranted that we have entered into the ICU, we have got a continuous oxygen uh, by prongs giving over there, our mucous membrane is damaged over there, the nasal mucous membrane is damaged over there, my quality of nursing care has uh, is not what actually could, could have been in, in, the, in the best of the circumstances. And the uh, steroids reducing the immunity, the diabetes coming up, and diabetes also getting a steroid. So it became a sort of a Shakespearean comedy of errors that brought about the whole thing, which brought about this so called uh, uh, black fungus, which is, I do not know how the name came across, but uh, it, look, it looks very nice in Ajit movies, but uh, in a medical terminology, you know, it is, it is mucormycosis, and that's what it, what, what it actually is. So, having said that, the amount of number of patients who are coming in probably at this point of time, I think there are about 16 patients in our in the, in the ward at present in LNJP. And if you take the whole view about this, I think um, uh, Dr. Chakravarti has given a very well overview of what the problem exists. We are the diabetic capital. We are the mucor capital also probably at this point of time now. So, this is what our problem we are being faced with. The issue that comes is how do we go about it? Number one is the early detection suspicion. But add to that mucorphobia, which is there, which is something which again is not good. You know, the, the people are scared about mucus and everything. But whenever they see even a nasal crust coming out, you know, my, our national pastime is do nothing but put your finger in the nose and bring out something and he sees a black scab over there. Oh, I have mucus, I have, I have mucus now. So that sort of a mucorphobia has also existed. And the patient has been in the hospital for probably the last three weeks, one month. And he has just come out of it and two weeks later, he again has another issue of uh, maybe he has a fungal infection, mucormycosis infection, and the scare of going back into the hospital, non-availability of drugs. You know, our, again, our society is such the minute you have declared a drug as being essential drug or required drug, it simply just disappears from the market. And, and this adds to the panic situation uh, overall. So the mucorphobia is there. But the main thing is early diagnosis, suspicion, uh, we'll probably we'll come across it as we go progress in the panel. But the ENT surgeon must be aware, the nasal endoscopic uh, availability, the diagnosis, the support from the microbiology department, and free availability of amphotericin B, and the availability of surgery. This again, I think, is one of the problems which we have faced. Because the OTs were closed, the OPDs were closed, so the diagnostic procedures, the diagnostic endoscopies really could not take place at the required rate as they were. And now the OTs are opening up for the uh, management of the mucormycosis deprivement. So I think just as an opening statement to carry the panel forward, we'll come across it as we face the problems uh, during the panel discussion. Thank you, sir. So the next other person after ENT comes into spotlight before, I mean, of course, intensive care, but before that, I would like to come to the ophthalmologist. So Dr. Sanjit Dhawan, can you tell us again, being from Max and otherwise, what is happening? And again, what are the warning signs and how should we all be careful? So of course, as uh, has already been pointed out, all these signs have been told also. But and by the time the disease reaches the eye, it's already too late. Dr. Chakravarti said it's actually too late. And uh, 
Uh, if there's a diminution of vision, if there's a doubling of vision, if there's a congestion in the eye, if there's a proptosis, if any visual symptoms are there, and uh, if there's a proptosis and all is there, it's already a very late stage of the disease. It should not reach that stage. It should be picked up much earlier on. Dr. Gulati said that nasal endoscopy, that is the answer. A uh, diagnostic nasal endoscopy done in early stage can pick up this, this disease much early and can be managed much, much early. But unfortunately, that is not the case what is happening, that uh, there are a lot of patients who are reaching us in a late stage and landing up with exenteration. Exenteration, of course, is the surgery of choice once it reaches the orbit. Dr. Chakwarthi again rightly said that if we do not exenterate, you are basically, you know, inviting recurrence of the disease. No? So that's a very, very big. So in very, very early involvement of the orbit, can one think of saving the, uh, the eye and the orbit, but mostly it is not possible. It's a very, so very sad we, state. No? So how many cases have you started encountering of the of orbital or mucromycosis? I think we've already done about uh, five, six exenterations in max in the last uh, one month, no? which is a big number. That's, that's that's a really huge shocking number. That's a huge, huge, huge that's, number. That's a huge number. number. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the one thing which I'd like to point out here is that, you know, uh, the phrase of misuse of steroids is being used in the media by various people. I think we should avoid that. Whenever anything goes wrong in India, we start pointing fingers at others now. That somebody is doing something wrong. Somebody is misusing it. Why can't we think in terms of scientific terms? We say that 80% of the patients were male. Are the steroids being used only in males? Are only the males who are diabetics? No. The diabetes and steroid use is universal. But why is 80% male making an effect? So we need to think more over and above that. There are a lot of other factors which are there, known and unknown. We need to explore that. So rather than saying misuse of steroid, we say, yes, yeah, okay, fine. Steroid is definitely one of the contributory factors which predisposes to fungal infection. But here, I don't think steroid is the main culprit. We still don't know what is the main culprit. Why suddenly there's a surge of these cases over the last uh, one year? We have used steroids for a long time. We've had diabetics for a long time. Diabetics are available all over the world. Why is it more common in India, the, the fungal infection? Why is mucus more common now? And uh, we need to th think in scientific way. We need to have very high index of suspicion on everything. Anything could be possible. And uh, yes, somebody said that uh, industrial oxygen use so very scientifically, somebody else studied it also. They said that if they tried to culture that uh, distilled oxygen, they could not uh, you know, find any spores in the oxygen. So all that has been tested. It was found that there's no, there's no fungal spores found in the distilled oxygen at all. So that is the way to go about uh, doing things. We should scientifically explore the reason and the pathogenesis of this uh, condition in COVID. Why is it happening more commonly? Yes. It's very easy to dismiss it and say, okay, fine, diabetes and steroids is the, is, is the reason. That is not the reason. I don't believe so. Because if you look at all the factors, you know, a simple factor of 80% being male, why is, it, why, is, why is that so? So true. So I... You are... We can't use Please. Please okay, yeah. So now uh, we've got the view of an ENT of the medicine. And the, my, the mycologist, so now we come to the man of the hour who is the intensivist, so Dr. Prakash Shastri. Can we have your views and your experience and uh, just as opening question, so what is the state? I'm really glad that uh, I'm, uh, I'm not in the uh, seat of ENT surgeons or ophthalmic surgeon. The other day I was conducting a webinar along with the ophthalmic surgeons and we had one of the ophthalmic surgeons coming online from the operation theater itself. A lot of you would know who that is, but I'm not uh, saying her name. But I asked her this question, how many exenterations have we done today? And she said six. So Dr. Sanjay, you're lucky. We did, and this was last Thursday. This was last Thursday that we did six exenterations in one day. That is one aspect. The other aspect is, now I have at least four mucormycosis cases in my ICU as I speak. Right now, I'm, I've, I'm in my ICU actually where I'm talking to you. And uh, why we managed to take these patients early was because by default, the, uh, the switchboard tends to give the call to us if the patient is coming from the ICU. And I've got one very good case with me whom we have done everything possible. It's not a heavy diesel. This gentleman was positive for COVID on 27th of April. And from 27th of April, he was treated in a private hospital in Delhi and he became better. But on the 6th of May, that's hardly 15 days ago, 
on 6th of May, he complained of headache. And he said, or sir, Dr. Achal, I will tell you about Hindi. He said that my eyes are falling from my mouth. This was the word that he used. And then, but because it was a very small nursing home in Rohini, Delhi, the, the doctor could not understand what it was. And they just gave him painkillers. Then the wife, who is a very intelligent lady, she went up to the head of the department of that wherever she was. And, and that head of the department was also a lady. So that's why I believe she took uh, uh, mercy on this lady. And she came and saw her. And when she saw her, she said, listen, your husband has got a very serious disease. I think you need to go to some other place. And she called us up. And the moment she told the symptoms, there was no doubt in my mind that this is mucormycosis. So he came to Gangaram Hospital on the 11th of May. Now, 6th of May, he complained of headache. On 11th of May, he gets transferred to Gangaram Hospital. On 12th of May, he has undergone exenteration. He has got an, uh, debridement and endoscopic uh, clearance of all the um, uh, sinuses. Prior to the uh, uh, operation, the MRI was suggesting only some frontal lobe involvement Nothing else. It, the, the disease was confined to the eye as well as to the sinuses. But uh, after the operation was over, he did not wake up despite the fact that we had to use everything. Uh, so we did a repeat MRI and the repeat MRI, we saw multiple, multiple, several uh, hemorrhagic infarcts all over the brain. And now we have done the tracheostomy of this patient. He has been weaned off. He's on room air, but he is a vegetative state. So I don't know what to say in this case. Not that there is any dearth of people who can make a diagnosis. It's a question of, you know, at the peripheral level, and Dr. Varunlok Chakravarti talked about a common man. At the peripheral level, there is a horrendous, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to use that word, but there is a limitation of the sensitization towards this particular case. As Dr. Vatil has also said that, yes, these conditions are not common. And a lot of people on the panel will themselves say that in their lifetime, they have seen only a handful of cases. But those people who have been sensitized, who make an effort to make a diagnosis of mucormycosis, or for that matter, even aspergillus, they do find a lot of cases because their incidence is definitely high. And when they do pick up these cases early, and let me tell you, in the last September to December period, when I collected my data to contribute to Dr. Adlok's uh, uh, paper, we had a, I had 18 cases and I had only two deaths. And right now, on newspaper, Friday, Gangaram had 69 cases of proven mucormycosis. I shudder to think, I don't even want to ask what the number is today. It's probably 100. And that is the kind of uh, deluge that we are seeing of mucormycosis cases. And believe me, this time, our, by the time we are making a diagnosis, by the time we are able to do any kind of surgery and therapy, and yes, on Friday, and I was talking to Dr. Mridul Daga again on a different webinar on, on Friday, saying that I am prescribing amphotericin B. You are the person who is approving it. But on that particular day, we were short of amphotericin B. And he, he, he's, he can bear testimony to that. So there are huge challenges that we are facing right now. And having said all that, I have to admit, this is the second wave of COVID. And in the second wave of uh, COVID, I have to admit with full humility that the kind of energy that I gave to my patients in the first one, I am not able to find that energy in the second one. I, on that side note, I'll stop there. You can take it forward. Yes, sir. it is a really shocking situation. So Dr. Ima from the Premier Institute in the country, what is your experience? Thank you, Dr. Poonam. As all my clinician said that same thing is seen in the All India Institute also. Like when we compare with the first wave, first wave we thought that, okay, we compare with the 19 and 20 data, then we say that at least there is increase of two times. So we thought we never prepared for that actually. So uh, when we saw in the newspaper in uh, 10 days back from Gujarat, then I thought, they are talking about three disease. That time we had at least maybe 10 cases. So we thought within like four months, so I thought that cases are in Delhi, it's different probably, and Gujarat is different. But from 1st of May till now, we have got 
almost 91 cases they are admitted in our hospital and again some of the patients they are waiting in casualty emergency medicine so we have not yet admitted them so total may be more than 100 cases all patients or some of their them are there in our main hospital some of them are in trauma center some of them are in jhajjar so in three places almost more than 100 patient and i think uh, uh, like when we uh, our uh, clinician whosoever they suspect like i think for diagnosis purpose laboratory person what we can help is a clinician they suspect maybe all the group like ENT surgeon and physician, ophthalmologist, if they suspect early, if they send sample to us, maybe we can help. But 80% okay diagnosis clinic, clinician can diagnose, but at least lab person also we can support in the diagnosis. And like whatever sample we have got, like uh, till now we have got from 1st May to 21st, uh, 21st today, we have got 60 sample. They have sent a biopsy sample because many of our patients, they could not send the biopsy sample because it's a problem in the OT also. And in emergency med medicine, it's difficult to collect sample. So it was difficult. So they have sent 60 sample. And in 60 sample, we have got in 88%, it's a KOH calcofloor is positive. And culture positive around 33% till now. It's too early, 33. And most common species, again, what we used to get before also, that is, uh, uh, Dr. Arunach Lok Chakravarti also said that that is Rhizopus arises only, followed by other species. And every day, whatever sample, 8, 10 sample we get, there we get the mixed infection, both Aspergillus and Mucor. You may get in direct demonstration both septate hyphae, non-septate hyphae, but culture you may not get because all the mucor actually they overgrow. So in culture you may not get, but direct demonstration definitely you can get septate and aseptate hyphae. Thankfully for management purpose, maybe uh, if they are giving liposomal lampotrysin B, so it will cover, but we are getting. And... Uh, yeah. Okay. Other like candida and all, we are not getting right now in our institute from January till May, we have very few. So these two we are getting and from this May, we are only, mostly we are getting this Aspergillus and Mipor cases. So Dr. Ima, I think, yeah. So Dr. Ima, you think, yeah. Pardon? Some of the cases we are only getting the septate hyphae. Maybe there, if sample is not proper, then may uh, sample if collection is if insufficient, then maybe we'll get only septate hyphae. Micor we may not get, but if clinically if their sus uh, suspicion is very high, then they should go for the micor management only. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Ima. So your uh, experience is different. Like Dr. Sandeep said, they're getting a lot of cases of Canada versus yours, which is say you haven't got any Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dr. Sandeep, I would like to ask you something that is any role of screening high-risk patients? So See, for we, then we, patients? Yeah, so we've been, uh, especially, especially in context to mucor, we have been debating that. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, contrasting views. So the question being asked is that, at the time of discharge, because um, as Dr. Arun also um, uh, Arun Lok also said that uh, the median time for development of mucor is about 18 days, so three weeks. So uh, there are a large number of patients who have actually been discharged and then develop these symptoms. So the question is, should there be a screening nasal endoscopy done at the time of discharge universally versus for high risk people versus only for people who report with some warning signs? So I think, uh, I person and this is my completely personal opinion, and you know the the opinion may be very divided in this, but I think universal routine nasal endoscopy at the time of discharge is unwarranted. Uh, that's overdoing probably, uh, and we know that is about ten percent at the most. Uh, so we have what we have instituted in Max is that we are now giving a 
attach to a discharge summary a complete um, uh, note on faqs regarding what mucor is and when to suspect and what are the warning signs early warning signs and we have sort of told our physician colleagues that when they do the first review of these patients which is mostly a teleconsult they should specifically ask about those warning signs and only in those cases where there is a suspicion red flags warning signs should they be called to come for a physical consult and definitely then undergo a nasal endoscopy in those cases so that's what we have put as a protocol we have created a special mucor ward in our hospitals not because it is contagious or anything but because the numbers are so overwhelming so we thought cohorting these people in one uh, area may be logistically better for management in terms of the training of the nurses and uh, overall management um, so that's what we have done and most of these wards the moment we are opening them in various hospitals they are getting filled up so um, and we have created a hotline where any patient can whether system from max or outside can call up ask about so we have given them a script uh, the the uh, the call center guys and they have a scripted draft where they can ask specific questions and the moment they feel they have been trained on that that there are warning signs for mucor they immediately advise the patient to come to the hospital and and we have created a 24/7 multidisciplinary team uh, which has uh, a physician and ENT and ophthalmologist uh, 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 if required a neurosurgeon and an endocrinologist uh, who will see this patient And 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 admit if needed. Twenty four seven endoscopy facility and and KO strain um, and and uh, so in one week time sort of we have if talk, we talk about one hospital at Saket uh, we have right now thirty patients admitted in that single unit in one building. Yeah, Doctor Budhiraj, so this is uh, this is a very important information. While we are trying to put the cohorts as it is, I don't know if Arunlok is signed in still. He, I would like his comments as well. You see, it is giving a wrong uh, information uh, to the whole of country when we are talking of cohorting. Many people are not understanding this, and they are trying to think that it's an infectious disease and it's uh, causing havoc. Similarly, I would certainly like Arunlok actually to give away, so as he he actually did uh, did talk about various things, which is a misinformation campaign. And I'm a, a little uh, also worried that my own colleagues have some confusions. that the uh, oxygen itself will have spores and blah blah and then the spore count in the ear should we go for those spore counts in the ear and all these kind of activity but uh, i think uh, i am sure arunlok has a different take on this uh, i would certainly invite arunlok to go into these kind of infection control practices if they are different as compared to when we are talking of mucor mycosis as an epidemic i can tell you uh that uh, chad uh in case of this uh, what a lot of people have said uh, the humidifier water is the source okay the humidifier water through which oxygen is going on and that is bubbling going on in water even if there is mucor mucor will never produce spore without spore there is no infection hyphae doesn't produce the infection so if you don't produce spore there is no chance of getting any infection now the question is just now i was facing the same question there is the uh, insa and other people are thinking to seriously look into that industrial oxygen friends the industrial oxygen is more pure than the medicinal uh, medical oxygen it is 98% and here we are using 88% and this thing is that people are thinking that this contamination of mucor are mucor we are eating also mucor the thing is that in lot of our food there are mucors which are going inside so uh, you stop eating you stop why don't you look it through seriously this is the always the doctors try to get away from the main point i can tell you though i am not a predictor astrologer within a month this is going to go down the reason is all those who used to prescribe so called high dose of steroid now they are behind the curtain all of them have started using steroid in a proper dose and i am hoping that would really help us do you know what is the blood sugar of this patient have anybody checked into those people who have developed this covid associated mycomycosis some are 600 700 800 but from the health of this are all because of this steroid i say there are four issues sorry i am a bit uh, always agitated in this issue four issues one the patients are also responsible because they don't check their blood sugar 
they love Swiss, they don't take their blood sugar. In this case, doctors, there are two issues. I don't blame them because so many patients came, they had no time and oxygen crisis was there. So they wanted to put more steroid so that they can at least overcome this oxygen crisis. So these are the things which happen. Whenever you ask any of the doctors, this problem was there. And then there is the issue in case of the COVID. COVID is a seriously creating problem in case of the pancreatic cell. It is causing ferritin issue. There is the endothelitis issue. These are all factors together. So COVID is absolutely issue. Right. Absolutely and right. And fourth absolutely issue is the right. environment. Unlock the steroids have... vanish. Unlock the steroids vanish from the market. Really, the, the, a tablet was not available, an ampule was not available. Everything vanished. So, a lot of questions. And now, antifungals have vanished. Say, so I have I another thing before I, 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 I mute myself. Is But uh, what happened this year? Is there anything strain variation, which many people are asking, that do we have a mutant different, which is actually uh, damaging the endothelium more, attacking the many other organs, including pancreas with ACE2 inhibitors, and do we uh, close our eyes to uh, only these two factors where we are talking of steroids and diabetes and not look at the biology that has evolved of this uh, this uh, virus? Dr. Because, Dr. Arun, can you answer that? Yeah, you yeah I, I'm yeah. absolutely right. I second what Dr. Arun uh, Alok says. You know, we were seeing uh, two, three cases or five, seven cases in our medicine ward in a year or eight, nine cases. Okay. Right now, LNJP, we have 28 patients, not 16 was Dr. Dr. Gulati was saying, we already have 28 patients and the number is increasing. The problem has been mainly a poorly controlled diabetes and high use of steroids. You won't believe that I have seen prescriptions all across the country coming to me with the steroids to the tune of doses of dexamethasone of 16 to 20 milligram a day, of uh, prethylprednisolone or to the tune of 100 80 or 100 milligram a day being given to the patients because your body weight is 90, please take 90 milligram. So that has been an absolutely right, absolutely non-diabetics have sugars in our wards of the range of 300, 50, 400. And the problem is it is continuing for weeks together when we need to stop steroids. The steroid is not going to help your, uh, what have damage to the lung has taken place now after 10 days. But unfortunately, many intensivists and many of us are not stopping steroids to the admitted patients and continuing them for weeks together. And even on post-discharge, they're thinking that it would prevent fibrosis of the lung, or the damage would not occur to the lung. So there's been a huge surge. And that's why what is happening, as Dr. Gulati said, I'm getting calls now for last 10, 12 days, little headache to a patient who recovered from COVID and said, sir, can I get my test done for mucor? So it's a big, big challenge. And I agree that, yes, with this information and this thing going on in the air, now people have reduced uh, steroid. They are cutting down steroids. They are stopping it earlier. But the disease virus itself causing damage to the you know, endothelitis and the ACE2, uh, the receptor factor, these must also be looked into and would be looked into because uh, I agree with what doctor uh, um, was saying from ophthalmology, Dr. Sanjay, that yes, diabetics, uncontrolled diabetics, immunocompromised organ transplant patients, we have a huge, but still we did not have that large number of mucormycosis. We were not getting that. So yes, there is an additional factor in addition to steroid and uh, diabetes. And that's what Dr. Arunalo, Arunalo has also elucidated. I, fully oh, just I, I want to add one line. Uh, Dr. Chad, uh, for your information, already despite not, uh, means I didn't have put my dogma like that, I have already tested in three centers, the already the oxygen lines, humidifier water, only in one center, there is uh, some black fungus in one, one isolate of black fungus in one humidifier water. That is black fungus means that's a dimetitious fungus. Only one. Rest other all oxygen pipeline, and these are the three centers which we have checked till now. There is no mucor, but still we are continuing to do this because everybody is saying, "Karke to dekho, ham karke dekh I have no dogma in that sense. We <laughs> <laughs> have also raising his hand, so uh, sir, uh, please you can ask your question. <laughs>
Thank you, thank you, Dr. Pardiva. Uh, uh, hello, I am audible. Yes, yes, yes. Sir. Loud and clear. Dr. Watel and uh, Dr. Uh, Arun Lok. First of all, I'll say uh, you know uh, congratulations for you know for the nice webinar. Uh, it is the high time to uh, you know talk about the mucormacosis. I'll just, uh, you know, we have listened and we, uh, you know, most of the colleagues uh, know uh, what is mucor and what uh, to do. I will like, as I told before the start of uh, this, uh, I talked to Dr. Arunok also two days before when uh, I was supposed to uh, be in the meeting with the, uh, you know, Chief Minister. So I'll just request uh, uh, the uh, people here. I'm lucky that, that clinicians are also there, intensification are there. And Dr. Anulok and uh, Dr. Vatel and other macrobiologists. I'll just like that. Uh, please, you know, uh, uh, there are two, three uh, suggestions which I will like that they should be documented and should be given to the government. One is uh, some advisory uh, to the clinicians uh, regarding uh, you all are talking about the over use of the steroid. And uh, uh, also some advisory at the time of discharge to the patients. There was an idea that patient, as uh, you know, Dr. Buddhiraja had just said, uh, which I think we can implement the endoscopy uh, uh, at the time of discharge. Also, uh, you know, uh, we we can uh, give uh, Delhi government has uh, just. Uh, thought that uh, we can give uh, glucometer to the patients who have diabetes at the time of discharge and uh, uh, they can uh, return it back after one month or so. Uh, so that uh, the idea is that they should monitor the uh, sugar. And uh, uh, plus the other uh, you know, advisory to uh, the patients uh, regarding the early signs and uh, regarding uh, uh, not to... Uh, continue or not to have steroid uh, themselves after the discharge from the hospital because uh, some doctors are prescribing oral steroid even after discharge and uh, people are uh, you know uh, continuing uh, steroid so that also Dr. Anlok has just said that uh, it, it should be a uh, contraindication should be warned that should not be given but I said that uh, it should not be given at all whether it is uh, before or after discharge of the patient from the ICR from the hospital setting. So that should be advocated only during the hospital stay. Uh, another thing is which uh, you might have uh, seen, uh, we were talking about cohorting of the patient. Uh, uh, some message should go uh, from here that there is no need to set up a ward. I have been asked to set up two ward, one in GTB and one in Rajiv Gandhi, you all know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I really don't know what to do. Today, our Honorable Minister has visited, uh, you know, to see whether you have set up the ward. But I really do not know what to do. What is there in the Mukher ward? So, I just said, uh, he, he said, uh, you know, what is uh, what you have uh, done. So, I said there are uh, beds, there are monitors. I don't know what else we are supposed to keep in the uh, Mukher ward. So that is why I was just wanted, uh, I was really uh, surprised. I just said, uh, I could hardly, uh, you know, have a computer print mucormycosis ward. That's all. And um, the Honorable Minister has some pictures with that. So uh, I just wanted to know that message should go that we really do not know why uh, we should have, uh, a, you know, separate mucor ward or mucor OPD. Uh, so, I think patients can uh, report to uh, whichever OPD. The OPD is not uh, working in the uh, COVID hospital. Uh, but uh, somehow now, uh, with the grace of God, cases are going down. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Arnlok has uh, forecasted, this mucormycosis will also come down. Let's hope so. But uh, in the meantime, I think uh, it is high time we are getting call. Uh, uh, we have not started yet uh, the uh, mucor ward, but we are getting calls from Uttarakhand, UP, uh, MP, and uh, Punjab, Haryana, everywhere. And we are just saying, please give us time. We are, uh, you know, we are getting ready. So I do not know uh, what we are going to make. So, uh, but uh, the experts are there. If they can tell that so you should have something like this. 
So please. So, Dr. Answer. Achal, so Dr. Achal, would you like to answer that question about a Gunkar ward? You see, uh, Hamari, we, are, we are into a situation where if we have a collective group of one in, in one area collections over there, people tend to take more care of that. You know, suddenly once the COVID ward has been created, a COVID OT has also been created, a COVID, the amphotericin B has also been made available, had they been spread all over or as a general OPD population, maybe the amount of urgency could not have come in. People have become more aware, the administrators have become more aware. And I think uh, Dr. Sherwal would really agree with it. Ki only once a sense of urgency is created, only then things start working in our system. That's what I, I personally feel. So concentrated area, we have more. Suddenly our OT, you know, ENT OT today had 10 cases for um, um, removal of the fungus over there. So th that's how things work. You know, you need to have some sense of urgency to be brought in. Yeah, Dr. Sandeep. No, urgency, sir, what is happening is, even for example, the COVID wards, now they, they, the, the patients' attendants want their tests to be done almost every day. They get COVID negative, they get PCR. Well, please take us out from here. Please take us out from here. You see, this is also creating another kind of nuisance when you are delivering the healthcare. So it has all pros and cons. We need to actually figure out as to what really are we achieving when we are trying to say that. And if you are saying that it is only because that is sense of urgency, probably the patient's condition itself uh, does flag this patient and the urgency is created. Otherwise, there are other outfalls which create a nuisance as far as the functioning of healthcare workers is concerned. Dr. Sandeep. Yeah, I would make a point. I would again clarify that the reason for creating Mucor Ward is entirely from logistic reasons. Yeah. All of us know yeah. there is no... Yeah. Let, me, yeah. let me finish, sir. Let me finish, please. Yeah. We know that it is not contagious. It does not. It is not like a COVID ward, which is to be isolated. Now, understand that we create a multidisciplinary team. And if there are 30 patients spread across 12 different floors, the team goes to 12 different floors. Here in one ward, the four people who are doing the round, the endocrinologist, physician, the ENT, ophthalmologist, in one hour, they can finish the round of 30 patients in one go, number one. Number two, all these patients require three times a day sugar monitoring. All patients in all floors do not require. Here, the nurse in one shift can take random blood sugar or three times a day uh, in one go, uh, three times a day. Number three, training that amphotericin B has to be diluted in 5% dextrose. The tubing should not have normal saline given before. That has to be a different tubing. Insertion of pick line, maintenance of pick line. And this is bulk patients we are talking. These are not critical. These are not ICU patients. So what we have found that these 30 patients spread across 12 floors. Still, if a person opts, wants a single room admission, he will be given a single room. Then he will not be cohorted. But logistically, in a constrained environment, in the pandemic setting, I think it makes a lot of sense to co do cohorting only from logistic reasons, not from infection control. I want to please uh, read. I agree, I agree because we also have done that for logistic reasons. And we did ample clear uh, explaining that it has nothing to do with infection control. Absolutely. Dr. Sanjay? So I, I had two comments, to make, mm -hmm. two comments to make. Of course, one has already been clarified by Dr. Budhiraja. That is for the operational purpose that these cohorts have been created, which is a very, very scientific, logical way of approaching things. Second is on the, uh, the original point of... Uh, screening part, uh, there is one modality which we are using in COVID patients, but we are underutilizing, which can be used to screen for mucomycosis also. We are doing CT chest for almost all serious patients. At the same point of time, we can actually do screening of the paranasal sinuses also. And I think it should start from the very first CT. So every patient of COVID going for CT chest should be screened with the paranasal sinuses as well, because there are specific signs of mucomycosis which can be picked up on CT of the paranasal sinuses. And it would just mean extra two, three, four minutes for that patient. Patient is already paying for the CT chest. The time is being spent. Patient is going to the for that thing. It'll just you know take a little, little few, say more time, and which can be very important too. Which can also give us an idea whether there's any pre-existing colonization of the sinuses by the uh, mucor or not. Many times we're seeing a rise in this uh, sinusitis in these days now, which is not uh, mucor. Or mucus can be picked up at a very, very early stage if uh, subject to this kind of uh, thing, even before the symptoms can uh, come up. No? So that is one, that's just an idea. And uh, it's open for uh, discussion and counterpoints. No? So true. So, uh, yeah, Dr. Daga, no, would I, you like I don't some agree with this idea. I don't agree to this idea of doing a Why, CT, sinus, CT sinus for every patient going. Only a select group of patients. I agree that he must also be talking about only a select group of patients. Because if you start doing CT sinuses or everyone going for CT chest, 
that would be a huge number. So only a select group of patients, you know that is a high risk patient, has uh, so many comorbidities existing, has taken steroid for a long period, he has already had some opportunistic infections. And if you are doing that, you know, otherwise uh, city sinuses sometimes may, you know, you may have, we have at least every third or fourth patient in Delhi has some or other form of sinusitis already because of the environment and all that factor. So I think you have to be very cautious. That's my Sir, suggestion. it can also give us an idea that whether the pre-existing sinusitis is also predisposing the patient to the mucus infection or not. So it's a, it's a, it's a, th it's a thought, it's a, it's a thought, you know, and it's open to discussion. But uh, so, uh, because patient is already being subjected to CT, it only means a few extra minutes for the, for the patient's time in the CT time, you know. So from there, I think I would like to ask Dr. Vatal because I think Gangaram, they have this uh, post-COVID uh, policy. Uh, so, sir, could you answer me post-COVID and COVID policy before I come to Pratibha to answer I was the questions? To that. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Because we, uh, because Bidhi Raja sir also mentioned that we do not accept that you do routinely the uh, endoscopies before discharge. We okay. are only I, no no. I don't say routinely. I said only in high risk individuals. Yeah, not only routine. in high risk, only yes. in high risk cases yes. who, who were are totally uncontrolled diabetes came with uh, very high uh, uh, comorbid conditions and uh, they were uh, having a very high uh, uh, COVID score. And those are the ones they should be discharged after doing a bedside endoscopy with all kind of advices as it is. Our ENT colleague here, I think, could advise us how easy it is because nowadays the kind of gadgetries and the endoscopy equipment that you have, the bedside endoscopy is probably may not be a big deal as compared to you go on to with contrast uh, the CT scans on the MRIs. And Dr. Um, Unam, I, I would just like to uh, come in over here. <clears throat> you see, when does when does mucormycosis come into the picture? It comes into the picture about four weeks after the positivity rate comes into the thing. So, <clears throat> what comes over here is the patient is discharged earlier than that, so there would not be any too much of a point for doing a screening CT or anything of that sort. Coming down to an endoscopic procedure, once the patient is being discharged, normally the patient stay in the hospital is about fourteen to fifteen days or maybe less than that. I Sandeep would be able to correct me on that and. When I come on to that, so the 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 time when the mucormycosis would be manifesting itself would be something like two weeks after uh, the COVID uh, COVID company has come out to be negative. That is two weeks after he's been discharged. So that is the time when the uh, endoscopy would have the significance. So just doing a screening endoscopy at the time of discharge maybe is not going to help us too much in those cases. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Budhiraja, what do you think? I absolutely agree. So that's exactly what I was saying that there was a big debate going on about routine screening endoscopy. And that's what I exactly said that I am not in favor of doing it. There are a lot of, most of the, the A loss of patients in ICU is about two weeks or so, but there are patients who stay because of a lot of post COVID complications. Uh, they get shifted to non COVID ward yes. and the length of stay exceeds three weeks. There's a subset of patients in those patients. If they have high risk features, that is the only area where I feel that screening endoscopy may have a role. Otherwise, as Dr. Achal said, I absolutely endorse and agree with that, that majority of patients who are discharged in two weeks time need not undergo any screening procedure. They are just discharged with a clear advice of the warning signs. And in the first follow-up visit on a teleconsult, that di discussion happens. If they have any red, uh, sign, uh, red flag signs or warning signs, they should be called back for a physical consult. And that's the time when they undergo a nasal endoscopy. That's about three weeks uh, from the uh, you know, uh, recovery time or, or the illness. We have, we, have, we have around 80, 85 cases right now that, that we have been seeing half of them in the OPD and others. And uh, almost 80% of them have come after having had COVID uh, maybe two months, three months, and even some of them have come after one month or as 18 days. But primarily, we have we started with patients who started uh, who had COVID in November, November, December, January, and then they started trickling, and that's how the thought process came. Was it prudent at that time? Maybe from the hindsight side, you say that was it prudent at that time? Was there any telltale before they were discharged, and they came now with mycormycosis? So that was the contention which was going on. Yes, Dr. Daga, please. Yeah, uh, so we have had now a few patients which uh, have COVID and mucor both together. We have had few. Yeah, very, very. Yes, yes, yes. We are still trying to 
you know, completely figure it out whether they had problems for quite some time before they came to our facility. So right now we have had, we have few patients who have, with Sandeep would also have COVID and both together also. It's not absolutely that they will always will come after that. So, no, no, so we have had patients in our 10th day with you. Exactly. That is yeah. the point. Why, that's the reason why I yeah. said that patient, why patient going for CT that. chest. Yeah. yeah. Because there are patients who have not had COVID, have had mucurinum. There's another factor that we need to take into account is that for last one year, all of us have been wearing masks. You know? It alters the humidity level. It alters the heat level into the nasal uh, mucosa and the sinuses. Could this be predisposing to, say, colonization of the, the sinuses by the mucus? Sir, Dr. Achal, you're the right person to answer that. See, the uh, mucormycosis is basically an invasive disease. You know, it, it, it has to uh, uh, invade the uh, cell over there before it... Therefore, even uh, just a, say, taking a swab and all is not going to help in those cases. The cha early change in the mucosa on uh, nasal endoscopy uh, would lead to a, would, would be a reason for a lot many things, actually. You know, the patient has been in the in the ICU, the patient has been even in the ward, he's been on oxygen, maybe he's on a prolonged oxygen or maybe he's on an oxygen catheter. So the some amount of trauma in the uh, in the nasal mucosa would have occurred, some amount of congestion would be there. So it would not be very easy to differentiate at that point of time with on the nasal endoscopy itself. But the uh, hallmark over here is if you have a strong clinical suspicion, if the red flags are on, if the red flags are on, if you think that the symptoms are warranting a uh, thing, uh, you know, something like difference in the sensation between the cheek, the infraorbital paresthesia, which is occurring, a brawny swelling below the cheek, uh, dental abscesses, microdental abscesses. Uh, all these things would uh, hoist a red flag to think in terms of then going ahead. And over here, one thing I would just like to say is this is one area where you don't have to wait for a biopsy report. At least a presumptive treatment can be started. Wait for the final diagnosis. You can discontinue. There is no time. But probably those two or three days you save is going to be um, uh, important where... Uh, maybe the IE or something uh, gets over there. Because see, the uh, lamina papricia and the cribriform plate, they are the thinnest parts from which this uh, infection can spread in. So our intention is to see to it, if it is there, it doesn't really go into those areas. Yeah, but I just wanted to add to what, sorry for prolonging this, yes, you know, was wearing mask and so we need to know really, are we getting patients of mucor after two, three months or any one of those who never had COVID? So if we are, we were earlier also getting non-COVID with mucor, the number was very less. But current wave, if we are getting everyone who comes with mucor is only with the history of COVID recently or past or two months, then it's an area to consider whether that, you know, because just wearing a mask in a normal individual uh, should not, you know, subject you to... No, it will not COVID. cause the COVID, sir, but it may create the circumstances which may lead to COVID, even in case of breakdown of the immunity, which is happening in COVID. Yeah, that is that is possible. So, that is, so see, we, we need to be we, we need to be open to the thought that maybe you know this mask is kind of helping the fungus colonize the sinuses, not invade the walls. Sir, so, yes, yes, so like to okay, it's now. Doctor Ima, Ima wanted to say something. Sir, last year, like in our uh, hospital, we had like uh, ninety cases of. Uh, mucormycosis. Out of that, only 15% were COVID and rest of them were non-COVID. So that last year also patient people, they were wearing COVID in this mask. And another thing, Western literature says in neutropenic patient, even the, uh, they wear the mask, they have done the like, they have taken swab from those patients, quite a lot number of patients, 200 patients, still then they have not got from the this patient, neutropenic patient, I am talking. So usually, yeah, Dr. Achal. Colonize. Dr. Ferritin, Achal, sir. Ferritin, Last ferritin, question. Level, ferritin levels have created a, a, a correlation between the two. Yes. You know, that, that's something which yeah. needs to be looked at yes. uh, with, with great concern. Yeah. So, so I think since we're running out of time, so can yeah, I just, move to the yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is, you see, my concern is we always say that the early diagnosis is going to change the outcomes. In this scenario like this, where we are saying that wait for things to appear and then we are going to get in. Is there any thought process where we get into this this kind of a, uh, you know, thought process that we need to diagnose much early so that we can change the outcome? Because the outcomes, once the people come with fluorid uh, uh, mycosis is, is horrible and uh, the mortality is very high. So our attempt in getting into these kind of activities is primarily to get the early diagnosis. So is there any merit in doing something, maybe overdoing 
and maybe we pick up even a case or two which may be 100% for them so there will be a difference between early diagnosis and prophylaxis you know prophylaxis so don't again, any, not, we don't recommend prophylaxis sir no sir no sir we don't re recommend prophylaxis no sir but early diagnosis suspicion the red flags which are there like what dr sandeep said <clears throat> at the at the first consultation and tele consultation if the red flags are hosted call him back do the endoscopy do the ct scan if you want to do it whatever it is but then that's the time when you start presumptive treatment Okay. Pratibha, can you just take over and see if there are any important questions listed on the chat box which you can do because we are quite over short of time. We have few online questions. Most of them have been answered. A uh, few are remaining. Uh, pertaining to microbiology, I would. Uh, there are a few questions that regarding the sampling because it may not be possible to have an ENT endoscopic guided sample always uh, at your hand. So, uh, what other sampling can be done? Whether swabs are acceptable in emergency situations or any scrapings? So I think so, Dr. Ema and Dr. Gulati sir can answer this. Um, we have seen it. Uh, usually they used to send us the swab sample, but if I can say that swab sample is not acceptable, only 15% we could get the positive. Uh, if you compare with the biopsy sample, so preferable sample is biopsy sample. If not, then crust area may be blackening area, they can take that sample and send the lab. Yeah, I, I think I'll agree with that. Swabs will really not make a difference because of the invasive type of the fungus which is there. A biopsy is the ideal thing which is there, but send it for KOH preparation because that can be available within half an hour's time. You can get, get the result over there. Uh, thank you, sir. So that answers our question. And then other questions regarding, uh, uh, not regarding mucor, we'll turn out to some other infections as well who have been confusing. Uh, one question was regarding assay, which is frequently coming as false positive with COVID. So uh, in, in the clinical uh, opinion, what all uh, think is that whether actually we are encountering some typhoid along with COVID or is it truly a false positive? So... <clears throat> Uh, let me try to answer that. So it's been a very, very common clinical issue. A lot of people are getting, uh, as a part of uh, fever workup, Typhidot and Vidals and all those, which are coming positive. And uh, I can tell you, a large majority of these uh, are false uh, positives uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, cross, uh, we know the shortcomings of IgM serological tests. So unless until patient has uh, clear, clear clinical signs and suspicions of typhoid, blood culture would be a better uh, bet to do. I'm not saying that if COVID is there, typhoid will suddenly disappear and it will cease to exist. Uh, we need to be cognizant of facts that malaria, dengue, typhoid, etc. will happen and can happen. But uh, Vidal and uh, the serological based tests are not reliable in present context. Uh, and, um, you know, just like we do fever workup for any patient, I think the gold standard still would remain blood culture. Um, and uh, that's I would say. I'm glad to hear that, sir. Absolutely right. I know. I'm because glad to hear that. No, but the problem with uh, the labs right. is that they are doing that fever panel and creating that confusion. You write, I mean, you don't advise, but patients get their fever panel done and come with IgM positive, <laughs> type dot positive, and all that. That's a very bad. <laughs> they do the they do the toxicology so also as a part of that. <laughs> yes. Pratima, any more questions? Uh, a few more questions regarding uh, H1N1 influenza. That uh, suddenly there has been a shift in the epidemiology, the epidemics that we were facing till uh, last year, that dengue, we had the seasons and ICUs full of H1N1 influenza. So what change have you seen in this year uh, as compared to the previous or any co-infections along with COVID uh, in these infections? See, uh, let me answer that uh... I mean, some places we are not even doing that test, so we don't know. But yes, uh, it has been pretty less. And even the literature suggests that somehow or other during COVID pandemic, the other uh, seasonal influenza and all that has been much less. So there is, I think, some underlying reason for that. I mean, you as microbiologists would throw more light nice. on that. But we are finding it a little less. I, Dr. Ima could say some Masking, so masking problem. Mask, mask, sir. <laughs> TB, for example, TB has vanished. I am, I am sure it is still there. No, sir, TB, TB, TB is not gone away. TB, TB, I would say, is not gone away. TB well, it's, yeah, it's more scary, sir. It might come up more with all this. Yeah. But the TB so, patients are not coming to the hospitals now. They absolutely. And so is for other fevers. Yes. They, are, they are not coming. That's a very sad part. So. 
so one more question is that uh, whenever uh, some at some places mycology services or koh and those services are not available culture or koh or histopathology so in that case is based on the clinical features and ct findings can the treatment be started uh, in such cases um yes it can be started i think preventive treatment can be started in these cases when the red flags is there you have a history uh, suspicious of the things go ahead with it to make it very simple for all of you i as an authorizing person has asked for any report available whether it is <laughs> ct scan or anything suggestive we don't even that check that years. i know so you have to accept that but yes you don't just the you know integrity of a treating physician or intensive the problem aapki step ke baad hai sir aap to approve kar dete hain you are in for surprising i tell you a direct from max i tell you a direct from max i told uh, your patients attendants that humne max mein patients ke liye 6 7 din ki supply bheji aap sab mein 3 3 din use kar lo ho sakta hai 2 din baad एंडोस्कोपी <laughs> But sir, so I'll just say one thing on a, on a on a lighter note. Last, you know, every year, twice a year, I had to start on my inhalant steroids for my asthmatic situation. Last one and a half years, I have not had any inhalant thanks to the mask and the pollution which has come down. So there is a silver lining to every cloud. Yes. But sir, one thing I will say, you know, I, I saw a very nice quote by Haruki. I'll just read it out for everybody. Once the storm is over, we won't remember how we made it through or managed to survive. we won't even be sure whether the storm is over but when we come out of it i am sure we won't be the same people whom we were when we entered the storm so i think this is what is going to summarize what we have been through in the yes, last one and a half years yes well, and so well with said. that lovely comment i think we can um, thank you so much for all being here thank you dr achal dr daga dr sandeep buddhi raja dr I sanjay ima dr watal dr chakravarti everybody personally, i personally apologize for my presentation today but uh, that's so, so by for, for so it's perfect you all right sir it served the purpose yeah. so yeah. 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 very valuable sir no, no. thank you thank so you. thank you all thank, thank you so you. much everybody any last thank comments dr daga or watal any last something other thank you no, so I much i think uh, many things were discussed and i'm glad that we are going to make some guidelines and some things have got some clarity as as it is uh, by many more uh, wider comments from our other colleagues from other specialties so will be this will be very very beneficial for us to make the guidelines as dr sherwal was suggesting and then giving it to the uh, to delhi government thank you very much ladies and gentlemen you, for being over here thank you sir thanks to prateep and to dr devjani thank you thank you for all the panelists speakers thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.